Welcome all to Sharktoberfest 2021. We're so excited about this year in particular because it's our 15th anniversary. Um, and I wanted to introduce you to my co-hosts here. First, we have David McGuire of Shark Stewards and Sarah Heinzelman of Greater Farallons Association. And my name is Carol Preston, and I work for NOAA's Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. And I wanted to just take you uh, to show you where the sanctuary is. I'm actually in the visitor center right now, and there's that beautiful mural behind me. But I uh, want to show you where we are in San Francisco. Okay, here we are in the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. And it's about this, it's an underwater park just outside of San Francisco. And it's about the size of Yellowstone National Park. And we started Sharktoberfest really to celebrate the return of the big white sharks to this area every summer and fall. And the, they return to the Farallon Islands and they stake out their territories. It's the same territory year after year. And they come really for the food. And one of their favorite seal meals is the elephant seal. And this year, and actually starting 2020, last year during the pandemic, we went virtual, which really allowed us to expand our program to include the One World Ocean. But we have a pretty heavy focus on the Pacific Basin here because that's where most of our, uh, where we started out and most of our partners are from. But I did want to show you the sanctuary system. So we have some freshwater sanctuaries up here. We have Stellwagen Bank on the East Coast, which also has a large population of white sharks. And we go all the way down around the Florida Keys here, lots of coral reefs and sharks in that area. And we're gonna see some in the, later on this afternoon. And we go out to American Samoa and Hawaii, Olympic Coast, and then we zoom in right in here. This is David McGuire with Shark Stewards and welcome to the 15th annual Sharktoberfest, celebrating sharks and all marine life with our favorite National Marine Sanctuary here at the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuaries. This is really exciting to continue celebrating sharks with you virtually. Uh, it's going from what was a community celebration into a truly international awareness event to learn, to research, and to conserve our, our precious marine life, especially the sharks. Sharktoberfest is really geared to celebrate sharks and to understand the importance of their role in our National Marine Sanctuary, in our coastal ecosystems, and even here in the San Francisco Bay. Sharks keep the ocean healthy and clean, and we need our sharks. So we celebrate them. We don't condemn them. We don't malign them. We love to have our sharks back, and we celebrate during Sharktoberfest after a 5,000-mile round-trip migration out into the Central Pacific. We're lucky enough to have one of the larger aggregations in the world of great white sharks, and we recognize their importance to the health of the marine mammals, to the fish, to the marine ecosystems, and they truly are symbols of how we can protect and we can conserve our ocean life. So I want to pass this over to Sarah, and let's have a great 15th annual, uh, annual Sharktoberfest. Thanks so much, David. And we're so excited to have you joining us today. We have a great lineup of programs. A ton of our per partners have contributed fantastic content. So we wanted to give a special shout out to California Academy of Sciences, CORE, Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, the International Ocean Film Festival, the Marine Science Institute, Minorities in Shark Science, Moat Marine Labs, Randall Museum, the Marine Mammal Center, White Shark Video, and we have special music by the ukulele friends Ohana of Marin and Max Delaney, as well as amazing art by Madison Clell. Throughout the day today, we'll have educational programs, crafts, amazing videos, fascinating science, and lots of good music. The day will kick off with programs that are more geared towards young children and families, and as it goes on, we'll transition to our programs that are more, more geared towards teens and adults. Thank you so much for joining us today. First up, we'll have programs from Greater Fairlands on shark diets and the pinnipeds in Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. We'll take a look at shark research taking place out in the sanctuary through an Earth is Blue video. You can make your own shark binoculars with the Randall Museum. And we'll join the International Ocean Film Festival for some amazing shark shorts. 
And we'll round out our first part of our program with a song from Greater Farallon's own Max Delaney, who not only runs our White Shark Stewardship Program, but is also a talented musician. Without further ado, let's get started. Welcome to the Greater Farallon National Marine Sanctuary Visitor Centre. We're out here at the Pier House today. If you remember last year, we displayed a number of different shark jaws and discussed how the teeth and jaw are adapted to eat different things. We finished with the sanctuary's favourite apex predator, the great white shark, which is a seal and sea lion specialist. You may recall the slimmer pointy teeth that act like forks, pinning the seal in place. And then you got the flat, triangular, serrated upper teeth that slice through the seal like steak knives, creating a lethal wound that causes the seal to die quickly, minimizing the energy expenditure of the white shark. In this program, we'll be looking at the five pinniped species, a pinniped is a seal or a sea lion, that white sharks prey upon at the Farallon Islands. White sharks eat fish until they're 15 years of age when they switch to a more calorie-rich diet of pinnipeds. With the help of still images, video, and artifacts from our collection, we hope to bring you a fun and fact-filled presentation on the seals and sea lions of the Farallon Islands. Thank you for the introduction, Pete, and welcome everyone to our virtual Sharktoberfest 2021. We are coming to you from our visitor center over on Chrissy Field. 27 miles straight out from the Golden Gate Bridge, we find the Fairlawn Islands. And around the Fairlawn Islands, we have our Greater Fairlawns National Marine Sanctuary. This covers over 3,000 square miles of ocean. And in these waters, we find about 16 species of sharks. Everything from the brown smoothhound shark all the way up to the second largest shark in the world, the basking shark. I always feel super grateful every time I get the chance to go scuba diving or see these amazing sharks, these chondrichthys or our cartilaginous fishes. But today we are going to be focusing on our white sharks and their diets and that kind of key switch they make between eating fish and eating those more caloric, more energy efficient pinnipeds. A few white shark life history statistics to keep in mind. When they're born, they're around 3.5 to 5 feet with litters of about two to 17 pups. And with all that energy expended, females take about two to three years between litters. Males reach maturity at nine to 10 years old, growing up to around 10 to 13.5 feet. Females reach maturity about 14 to 33 years old at around 13 to 16.5 feet. Uh, this is where they're making that key change in their diet from fish over to those more calorically efficient pinnipeds. Estimates for max size is around 18 foot uh, for the males and 19.5 to 21 feet for the females. But as some divers have found with a particular individual called Deep Blue off the coast of Oahu, estimates of about 22 feet, so pushing that max boundary. Keeping these statistics in mind, we'd like to focus on what brings them to the Fairlawn Islands every year, and that is a buffet of pinnipeds. Pinnipeds are, of course, our fin-footed uh, friends that we have here. They're broken up into a few different groups, and there's some key characteristics that can help us tell some of the differences between these different groups. Our seals, uh, they don't have external ear flaps like we do. You can give your ears a little wiggle. We can also see our sea lions down at the bottom. They do have those external ear flaps. Instead, seals, they can totally hear, but they just have those little ear holes. Another great difference is those four flippers. If we take a look at that sea lion down at the bottom, we can see that they have those long skin covered four flippers. Great for helping them walk around on land. Also great for propelling themselves through the water. Our seals, on the other hand, they got shorter, furrier four flippers, um, and they use their hind flippers to help propel them through the water. Uh, they also kind of move along the ground like an inchworm, um, rather than being able to walk a little bit more upright like their sea lion counterparts. 
Last thing to keep in mind is the difference between our seals and sea lions that could help you out uh, when taking a look here is that long neck. Sea lions have a much longer neck uh, than we do with our seals. So now we're going to play the game of name that fair lawns pinniped. How this will work, I'll show you a pinniped. I'll give you some hints about it. And then we'll see if you can guess which pinniped that might be. And then we'll learn a little bit more about that pinniped, its connection to the white shark diet and check out some artifacts with our friend Pete. Here's our first Fairlawns pinniped. These can grow between five and six feet long, weigh between 180 and 285 pounds, and they can frequently be found in marinas and lagoons. Let's see if you can name that pinniped. Is it a harbor seal, a New Zealand sea lion, or a bearded seal? You guys can pop your answers in the chat. You can type the name of the seal, or if you just like to type the letter, that totally works too. We're looking out. You did not need long at all. That is absolutely the harbor seal. Well done, everyone. Very impressed. Now let's learn a little bit more about this pinniped with some artifacts from Pete. So hey, everybody. I've got a harbor seal skull here that I'd like to show you. And the main thing I want to show you about this skull is if you look at the back teeth, they're pointy. Um, they're not flat molars like a cow or a human. And again, if you look at the front teeth, you can see these exaggerated canines. This is a carnivore. These teeth are designed for grabbing and ripping. Harbor seals eat fish. They eat small to medium sized fish, um, which they grab with these teeth. And they can't really chew or break them apart. So they're really gonna kind of get them to the back of the mouth and eat them whole maybe kind of rip them up a little bit, but definitely fish, definitely a carnivore. What else can I show you? The nostrils, pretty cool. Two big eye sockets. Um, seals have massive eyes, which are very efficient. They need to be able to see underwater where it's dark and murky and dingy, and having big eyes helps them do that. And if you look at the back, there's this hole called the occipital condyle. This is where the spinal cord comes out and the vertebra uh, come down covering the spinal cord. Harbor seal skull. So right here, I have harbor seal pelt. This animal was found dead by scientists on a beach. And after they did the necropsy, they gave it to us so we could use it as an educational tool. It's pretty cool. You can see it's kind of like this creamy, creamy color with black spots and a kind of dark stripe over the back. Um, these are the hind flippers with a little tail at the back here. This thing here, where is it? Is a four flipper at the front. You can see the nails. But the main thing I'm noticing about this pelt is it's very thin. It's quite thin fur. It's not like the luxuriant thick fur of a sea otter. It's very thin. That's because harbor seals, all pinnipeds, have a really big thick layer of fat, a really big thick layer of blubber. And it's the calories in this blubber that make them so attractive to white sharks. Our next pinniped is quite a bit larger than our harbor seals, growing between 8.5 and 11 feet long at 800 to 2,500 pounds. They're the largest member of the family Oteriidae. Rather than barking, they have a very distinct low frequency roar. So let's see if you can guess this Fairlawn's pinniped. <laughs> You got it. This is our stellar sea lion, and they are quite stellar, aren't they? On to our next Fairlawns pinniped. These are coming in at between five and seven feet long, around 140 to 600 pounds. Historically, they were hunted for their fur until 1984, of course, thanks to that Marine Mammal Protection Act. They have the longest flippers in their family. Let's see what you guys think. Could this be a walrus, an Australian sea lion, or a northern fur seal. And this one's a bit tricky. 
So look closely at some of those identifying characteristics we have. You got it! This is the northern fur seal, and despite that name, they are not a true seal or an earless seal. They have ear flaps just like us, making them an Oteriidae, just like our other sea lions. Now let's check out some artifacts from these pinnipeds with Pete. The artifact that I'm going to show you next, some of you might find a bit disturbing, but bear with me. This is actually a success story, though it may not seem it. 400 years ago at the Farallon Islands, there was about 200,000 fur seals, a really appreciable colony of this pinniped. In the 1700s, sealers wiped out the colony. They killed every single fur seal. They came from Russia, east coast of America, and Europe, and uh, killed all the fur seals for their rich fur. And what I actually have, it's a fur coat made from fur seal, and it's made in San Francisco, and it's probably about 200 years old. So it's conceivable, if you look at the label, there's the brand and it says made in San Francisco. It's conceivable that this fur coat was made from a fur seal that was on the Farallon Islands. But in 1968, the Farallon Islands became protected, especially Southeast Farallon. The other islands were protected, I think, in 1912, but the big island didn't get protection to 1968. And because of that protection, the fur seals started to come back. In 1980, a few fur seals hauled out. Now there's about 1,700 fur seals at the Farallon Islands. It's a fraction of the original population, but every year there's more. They're quite an aggressive pinniped, despite being the smallest pinniped in the Farallon Islands. And they're aggressively spreading their range. And it's a kind of neat story because if you protect somewhere, wildlife will come back. Northern fur seal. Continuing along our Farallon's pinniped journey, we have these friendly creatures coming in between 6 and 7.5 feet long and ranging from 240 to 700 pounds. These are the most common pinniped found at the Farallon Islands. And you may also be able to find them around Pier 39 in San Francisco. Hmm, who could this be? Could this be an Antarctic fur seal, a California sea lion, or a leopard seal? <laughs> No time at all needed. Absolutely. This is our California sea lion, the most abundant snack for our white sharks at the Fairlawn Islands. Let's learn a little bit more about these particular pinnipeds with Pete. Okay, what I have here is a male California sea lion skull. Stella's sea lion skull, male would be very, very similar, maybe a bit bigger because Stella sea lion are bigger than California sea lion, but essentially they'd be very, very similar. First, let's have a look at the teeth. And again, we're gonna to go to those back teeth that are really pointy. So uh, no flat molars, not like a cow or a human, doesn't do much chewing or crunching. This is a ripping, ripping teeth, ripping, te ripping and grabbing teeth. And if you look at the front teeth, these exaggerated canines, it's for grabbing. This is a predator. It eats fish. It can eat bigger fish than harbor seals. It can eat salmon. This time of year, if you go out on a boat of California, you can often see a California sea lion with a big salmon in its mouth, bashing it backwards and forwards in the water to break it up so it can eat it in bite-sized chunks because it can't really swallow a whole salmon whole unless it's kind of a really small one. Um, one thing I really want you to see, which you probably noticed right off the bat, is this thing here, which is the sagittal crest. And the function of this thing is um, to anchor muscles that attach to the jaw. That's the main function for it. It does have a secondary function, a sexual function. It denotes maturity in males. The young male California sea lions don't have this. It hasn't developed yet. But the large males, it's big, and it's a big fleshy forehead. If you go down to Fisherman's Wharf and see big seals with a big forehead, 
It's totally a big male California sea lion. You got the eye sockets, big eyes to see underwater in the murky plankton rich waters of the Farallon Marine Sanctuary. Occipital condyle at the back where the nerve cord comes out and the spinal cord um, attaches. Cool, male California sea lion skull. Rounding things out with our pinniped game. You guys have aced this so far, and we have saved the white shark's favorite for last. These pinnipeds range from 10 to 13 feet long. They come in between 1,300 and 4,400 pounds. They're the largest pinniped in the Northern Hemisphere. They also have one of the longest mammalian migrations on Earth at 13,000 miles round trip. And I'm super impressed by this one. They can dive to over 5,500 feet deep. Could this be the northern elephant seal, the Galapagos sea lion, or the Hawaiian monk seal? Guess correctly. This particular pinniped's giving us a little side eye, making sure you guess right. Of course you got it. You guys are pinniped pros. This is the northern elephant seal. Five out of five. Give yourself a round of applause. Give yourself some fin. You guys totally aced this pinniped quiz. Thanks for playing our Fairlawns pinniped game. Now let's learn a little bit more about these particular pinnipeds with Pete. Of all the pinniped species at the Farallon Islands, the elephant seal is the species that is eaten the most by white sharks, like this female and pup model that we have here at the Farallon's Visitor Center. They are the biggest pinniped on the island and have the highest fat content. So in terms of calories and energetics, Elephant seals are the number one choice for white sharks. White sharks also select the younger age range of elephant seals as their prey. The first, second and third year elephant seals are less experienced, which makes them easier to catch. The elephant seals that are born in the winter months return to the Farallons in early fall, which is exactly the same time the scientists start seeing white shark predations at the islands. No coincidence as the young, Naive, calorie-rich pups are the perfect choice for the white sharks. Adults are preyed upon too, even the four and a half thousand pound mature males. The experience of seeing an elephant seal predation at the Farallon Islands is quite spectacular. As the white shark feeds, a swimming pool sized stain of red blood spreads across the ocean. You can actually smell the metallic taste of blood in the air and hundreds of western gulls swarm the predation event like a white tornado trying to get scraps of the energy-rich elephant seal carcass. Thank you for joining us here at the Greater Farallon National Marine Sanctuary and exploring the world of white sharks and pinnipeds. I'm hoping you'll join us next year for Sharktoberfest and I'm also hoping you'll be able to come down to our visitor center next year and meet this guy, this big male elephant seal. We usually have it hanging out outside our visitor center. Look forward to seeing you and uh, enjoy your Sharktober. Goodbye. My name is Scott Anderson and I've been studying the white sharks out here for over 25 years and we're mainly doing a photo ID study but we've applied a lot of acoustic and satellite tags to these sharks. 
I think the biggest misconception of people in our understanding of sharks is that people are seeing them as this sort of mindless killer. But what we found through the research that we've done is that they're actually these incredibly complex animals. They are here on the coast to feed, but they have a very specific feeding strategy where they're at the bottom, they're looking up, and they're very discerning of what they come for. A lot of times you just can't see them. They're, they're really cryptic. The coloration on their back, and unless they're right there, you, you can't see them. And they are, I mean, they're super cautious. I think this giant predator, they're just jumping in and out of the water. They really are cautious. They like to, to know what they're getting into. Like you'll, you'll see that they'll swim around the decoy a bunch of times before they usually come up. We got one shark up, and a couple of the decoy that we didn't see, but it'll probably be on the camera, so it's a good day. Ahoy there! I'm searching for sharks with my nifty shark binoculars. Hi, I'm Nancy, and I'm happy to be here celebrating Sharktober Fest with our good friends at the Gulf of the Farallones. And I thought you might want to make a pair of these shark binoculars for yourself. So let's get crafty and make you some binoculars you can view for sharks. Okay, so what do we need? We need something that everybody has, no matter who you are, toilet paper rolls. So what we're gonna start with is when your roll gets empty, don't throw away the cardboard part. We're gonna save it and we are gonna make our binoculars from this. So what are we gonna start with first? The most important thing about spotting sharks out in the ocean is their fin, their top fin. Sails, when they're up to the surface of the water, you can see this fin come out of the water and that's how you know sharks are nearby. So first we're gonna start with making the fin. Now, you need to have a little bit of extra cardboard you can use any kind of cardboard, a cereal box, or this is a toothpaste cover, anything you have, little extra cardboard. And we're gonna draw, oops, we're gonna draw on here a shark shape, a fin shark shape. So I think that kind of looks like this. Something like that. Now you're going to draw two of them because your binoculars are two twin sharks. So what I would do is I draw my one and I cut it out carefully. You can use a pair of scissors or you could use a exacto knife. So I'll quickly use my X-Acto knife. I cut it out. I'm gonna just get the last of the cardboard away from the part I don't want. One shark fin. Now I'm gonna copy that on another piece of cardboard so I have the exact same fin. I like that. 
Now we're gonna cut this bin out. Again, you can use scissors or you can use an X-Acto knife just to get your two fins cut out. All right, two fins. So next, what we're going to do is we're going to take our X-Acto knife. And we're going to make a slit in the bottom of each fin. Just one simple cut. And that way our fin actually breaks apart at the bottom. Like that. Hmm, having a little trouble cutting all the way through. If your cardboard is kind of thick, you may have several layers, so you'll have to cut really. There we go. There's my second fin. So, how do we get the fins onto our shark? Well, this is a little tricky because this is round, and when you put it on a table, it's going to want to roll around. So you'll have to be really good at holding it down tight on your table. And we're going to make a slit in the top of the tube. Just a little thin slit. See how I made that? I just cut a slit in the top of the round tube. Then my fin fits right into that slit. Might have to make it a little bit longer if your fin is longer than the original slit you cut like I just did. Just enlarge it. And there you have your fin in your shark. Now, why did we slit them? Well, on the inside, we're gonna fold one of those one way, one of the tabs that you just made by cutting your fin in half. We're gonna flip one one way and one the other way inside the tube and that will hold it tight. Now we're gonna get a little piece of tape and tape those tabs to the upper part of your toilet paper roll. So what we're gonna do, sorry, we're going to slide this piece of tape in and tape those tabs to the top of the toilet paper roll. All right, now we have a fan that's not gonna go anywhere. Do the same thing for your second toilet paper roll. And when you get both fins on, we're at the next step. The next step will be putting the two rolls together. The easiest way to do this is with tape. So you would put a piece of tape on each end like so. So I put a piece of tape that went from here to here. 
because I'm squeezing them together. And then from here, around just like that. There you have it. So we don't look very sharky yet, do we? Not quite. So the next thing, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the shark mouth. And that's pretty fun. What I would do starting is to make a little drawing of how you want your mouth to go. And if you look at my original one, we have a large triangle cut from the side of the toilet paper roll. So we'll draw a large triangle, maybe something like this. How's that look? And then on the other side, same thing. I want to make them kind of even, but it doesn't really matter if they're not perfect. Then you'll take your X-Acto knife or your pair of scissors and you're going to cut the bottom straight. So this would be the bottom one as you're looking at your shark from the side. You can cut this straight away. Cut that straight away, like that. Now the top part is a little different because we want to make shark teeth. So in your same drawing, before you cut, let's draw some triangles facing downward. Like that. Triangles facing downward. So now when you're gonna cut, you're gonna cut around, you're gonna cut around the triangles so that this piece of cardboard where you made your triangle is still in place, just like him. It's a little bit like carving a jack-o'-lantern. I know you all do that at Halloween time. All right, let's see what we have here. It's a little tricky, but I know you're up for the task. There we go. Shark teeth. All right. So we're still getting to the fun part, and that is painting. Once you have your shark about the, the design that you want him to have, maybe he has three teeth, maybe he has four teeth. But again, remember, it's a little tricky to cut these little triangles and leave them in place at the end, but you can put as many teeth as you want. Now, there are many different kinds of sharks in the world, but I'm painting my shark blue, just because I like blue. And what I'm using is temper paint. Temper paint is good for this because it doesn't stain your clothes and it washes out really easily out of your hands too. So we're just going to paint our shark 
everywhere except those teeth. We're gonna leave those brown for the moment, toilet paper brown, because we're gonna come back with some white paint and paint the teeth white. You can paint the fin. and all the way around on both sides. Now, if you've used a box that has writing on the back, doesn't matter because once you paint it, you won't see the writing anymore. You'll just see blue. You might have to give it a second coat. So, once you've finished painting your shark, then you can move on to the teeth. And again, I like to use white because teeth are pretty white, even on sharks. And that way the teeth, which are the most in, impressive parts of sharks, they'll stand out. Next, this is a period of time where you're gonna to have to wait for the paint to dry. But once the paint dries, then you can either draw on eyes with a marker or I'm gonna do it on the side I haven't painted yet in, for the event of time. You could draw an eye if you'd like. Ooh, he's kind of scary. Or if you're lucky enough to have googly eyes from a craft store, you could glue some googly eyes on, whichever you'd like. Then the very last thing, so you don't lose your cool shark binoculars you're going to cut a hole or punch a hole into the edge of each side on the outside punch a hole punch a hole so that you can tie a string long enough to go around your neck all binoculars have to have a strap otherwise you have to hold them in your hand all the time. Sometimes you're not constantly looking. You want to use your real eyes to see and then sight and then hold up your binoculars. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed working with me to make shark binoculars. And I hope you have much, much more fun listening to all the experts talk about these amazing animals, sharks. Thanks again. Again, this is Nancy from the Randall Museum, and we hope to see you soon at the Randall and also next year live for Sharktoberfest at Gulf of the Farallones. See ya. Welcome to Sharktoberfest. My name is Anna Blanco and I'm the Executive Director of the International Ocean Film Festival and I'm so pleased that you're joining us today virtually. We look forward to this event as we celebrate the return of the Great White Shark to the Greater Farallones National Marine Sanctuary and in doing so we celebrate all things sharks. The International Ocean Film Festival is a volunteer-driven organization that uses independent films from around the world to raise awareness for the importance of our oceans, its marine wildlife, its ecosystems, and so much more. We are a year-round ocean conservation organization, and our signature event is a four-day film festival where we show films, we host panel discussions, and education programs for middle school and high school students. 
And our next event is on April 7th to 10th, 2022. So mark your calendars and I hope you can join us. For this year's Sharktoberfest, we selected two films that I think you're really, really going to enjoy. The first is titled Great White Shark and it's by Lacken Duskin of Petaluma, California. It's an animation film that is a real treat for anyone who is interested and who likes Legos. Um, our second film is titled Mako Sharks, King of the Pelagic Realm by Sean Heinrichs, with a special introduction by my colleague and member of the International Ocean Film Festival Screening Committee, David McGuire, who's also the founder of Shark Stewards. But before we get into the films, I'd like to share with you the festival trailer to give you a better idea of the types of films that we screen, and I encourage you to join us next April. In the meantime, enjoy the films and enjoy Sharktoberfest. Thank you. Islands roams an apex predator 21 feet in length, eating everything it can sink its teeth into. This is the great white shark. Let's start at the beginning, when the shark pups are born. Soon they'll be full grown. Before long, they're full size. The shark trivia. Each fin has its own name. Pectoral fin, dorsal fin, pelvic fin, anal fin, second dorsal fin, caudal fin. And that's the end of shark trivia. Great whites are endangered because people hunt them for sport or catch them for their fins, cartilage, and oils. Finning is one of the main reasons why great whites are still endangered. Hey, sharky shark. <laughs> After the fin is sliced off, the finners throw the shark back in the water. But is it really worth killing a great white for soup? Another reason is bycatch. Bycatch is when fishermen catch unwanted aquatic creatures by accident. Bycatch is dangerous to great whites because this prevents them from swimming, which makes them unable to breathe. This kills them. Great whites are important to the ocean ecosystem for many reasons. This is one of them. Seals are one of the main food sources for great whites. Eating seals is actually helpful because it keeps the seal population healthy. Or this will happen. seals, great whites also eat animals that are weak, sick, and dead. Eating dead animals reduces natural pollution. Also, eating the weak and the sick helps make the next generation of that species stronger and healthier. 
These amazing creatures need our help. We can help by not ordering shark fin soup at restaurants and by not buying products that contain shark cartilage or oils. Please tell friends and family about the importance of great white sharks. Thanks for watching. This has been Great White Sharks. Hi. I'm David McGuire here with the International Ocean Film Festival at Sharktoberfest with our Greater Farallons National Ring Sanctuary. Each year, among the many exciting ocean films at our festival, we feature a block of only shark-related films and conversation. This film, Mako Shark King of the Plagic by conservation filmmaker Sean Heinrich, features the fastest, most acrobatic shark in the sea and among the most threatened with extinction, the Mako Shark. This beautiful shark migrates through our West Coast National Marine Sanctuaries each year where they receive greater protection from fishing than on the high seas. Please enjoy the film with these beautiful sharks, and I hope you too will be inspired to help us at Shark Stewards, the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, and the International Ocean Film Festival as we work to protect them. Enjoy the film, and see you at the film festival in 2022. The pelagic realm, the vast open ocean, home to some of the most magnificent marine species on earth. And in this realm, we find one of the most charismatic predators, the Mako shark. Mako shark is a globally distributed species, from the tropics to sub-temperate waters. A female Mako shark has to be about 20 years old and three meters in length in order to be capable of reproducing. And then they reproduce very slowly, only having between four to 12 pups every three years. In the eight years I've spent on the ocean studying these animals, the hundreds of days out there on the water, I've only ever seen one, one mature female maker. However, if we even look at the fishery data in this region, the vast majority of animals are immature. The sizes of these animals has reduced through time. And we know through catch records, fishery mortality is responsible for that. So in a given year, we were catching bloody tens of thousands of Marcos and Blues. Yeah, it was, it was brutal, mate. I just don't see the numbers of those big fish anymore. I've watched it decline over the years, and it's going to take a long time for those fish to come back. Their fins and flesh are highly valuable on international markets, and in a recent satellite tag study, 30% of all mako sharks tagged died within the first year because of tuna surface longline fisheries. We're seeing this kind of pattern repeated across all of our oceans and across many of the targeted shark species. These animals regulate the systems that ensure healthy fish stocks that feed billions of people. When I slip into the water with a mako shark, there is a feeling I've never experienced with any animal before. There's a mutual respect, but a testing of, of whose world we're in. And there's absolute magic in that. The difference between a shark that's on the end of a hook and fighting for its life compared to these things that were in, in their habitat, they're relaxed, they're chilled, they're absolutely stunning to look at. But they're so graceful, mate. There's a cautious, calculated, perfectly evolved, yet extremely vulnerable animal looking back at me. Because for the Marco shark, their oceans are becoming ever more dangerous and globally, their numbers are in precipitous decline. To be honest, I actually feel bloody embarrassed the, the fact that I was involved with killing these, these animals, especially knowing how long it takes them to reach maturity. Here we were just catching them basically for the fins so someone could have a bowl of bloody soup. What's really important to acknowledge is that the Marco shark maintains balance of the fish populations we as humans perceive valuable. As concerning as it is to see so many sharks with hooks and traces, 
there's a bright side. This is definitive evidence that shows these animals can be released alive to live another day in the oceans. The vast majority of the sharks that we pulled in on the, on the surface gear were all very much alive. They quite easily cut off and let go. We know that the mako shark is biologically vulnerable to overexploitation, and that its numbers already are showing vast declines. Their fins are extremely valuable, and their meat is also a valuable commodity. But there is a way to help ensure the future for mako sharks. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES, is a United Nations body of some 183 member nations whose mission is to offer threatened species the management and protection they need to survive and recover. CITES can play a fundamental role to ensure the mako shark is not unsustainably harvested and traded internationally. We, right now, have the opportunity to afford critically needed protection for this animal. That if we don't, we will lose one of the most magnificent apex predators that have ever donned our ocean. Wow, what a great program. That was a wonderful song from our friend Max Delaney from the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. He's also in charge of the White Shark Stewardship Program. In this program, we have presentations from the Marine Mammal Center of Marin. And I encourage you, if you do get a chance to cross the Golden Gate Bridge and see their incredible facility, caring, uh, protecting, and, 
and generally rehabilitating our sick and injured marine mammals. Uh, they're going to give a presentation on our local marine mammals and a, a set on or a program on shark trivia. So that's a lot of fun. Following that is a presentation by the California Academy of Sciences. And I encourage you to go to Golden Gate Park and see the new shark exhibit. They're going to do a presentation on baby sharks. Please don't sing it. Next, we hear from our friend, education coordinator, Jennifer Stock at the Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, which is a Northern National Marine Sanctuary, kind of hugged by the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. If you look at from our, our uh, Point Reyes National Saint, uh, Seashore, west towards the Farallon Islands, you'll be looking right over this underwater sanctuary, which is a mountain that is abundant with marine life, including deep water sharks. So we're gonna dive deep into the Cordell Bank with Jenny, and then she's going to do a sketch of sharks so you can learn about shark anatomy. We're gonna wrap it up with a song by our friends at the Ukulele Friends Ohana. They come every year, they do hula, they sing, they play ukulele, that is shark-centric. And if you get a chance, check that out, Ukulele Friends Ohana online. You can learn how to dance or play ukulele. So aloha, happy Sharktoberfest, and enjoy the program. everyone. Happy Sharktoberfest. We're joining you with the Marine Mammal Center. So excited to be here. We've got some fun things in store for you today. We're going to kind of chat through a little bit about the Marine Mammal Center and then dive into some shark and marine mammal trivia. So it should be a really fun little session. But to kick us off right off the bat here, hello, my name is Laura Gill. I'm the Community Engagement Manager at the Center. So that means I have the pleasure of overseeing our outreach and public programs as well as our community engagement like our fairs and events across the Marine Mammal Center's California range as well as out in Hawaii and I'm joined by Diane would you like to introduce yourself hi everyone I'm Diane Hardy I also work at the Marine Mammal Center with Laura and we're actually on the same community engagement team so I have a pleasure of working with her and I work especially close uh, closely with our education volunteer and intern community at the center awesome thanks so much Diane so for anyone that hasn't heard of the Marine Mammal Center before, I'll just do a brief introduction here. We are, in fact, the world's largest marine mammal hospital and education facility. So essentially what we're doing is rescuing any sick or injured marine mammals along California coast, bringing them into our hospital, getting them better, and returning them back home to the ocean. So we are a nonprofit. That means that we rely very heavily on volunteer support. So we're doing this work with close to 1,400 volunteers, and we do have about 100 paid staff, including Diane and myself, to help all of these programs be successful. Now, we are have a pretty large range in California. We rescue as far south as San Luis Obispo and as far north as Mendocino County. So that is 600 miles of California coastline that you can call us to report marine mammals in need. And then we do have a hospital out in Hawaii on the big island called Keikaiola, where we're working exclusively with the endangered Hawaiian monk seal. Now, every single patient that comes through our doors, though, kind of starts off with the same story. It all starts with a phone call to our 24-hour hotline. So you can call 415-289-SEAL to call and report any sick or injured marine mammal in need. And then we'll send out a team of highly trained volunteers to go and assess and see if that animal does need rescue and then perform the rescue if that animal does need to come back for some rehabilitation. So pictured here, you see some of our volunteers with their equipment, like those big wooden shields or to help kind of herd the animal along the beach where we need them to go. We might use things like nets to help capture and rescue them. 
And then eventually we're going to move them into a large carrier or crate, just like what we, you would see for a cat or dog at home, only it's going to be much bigger for our marine mammals. And then we'll load them up on the back of our Ford F-150 rescue trucks and drive them to our nearest hospital location. So we do have field offices in San Luis Obispo, if we're down in that area, in Monterey Bay. And then where Diane and I are based out of in Salsalito is where all of our patients eventually make it. And here is where we have our veterinarians, our volunteers that are going to really help to diagnose that patient, figure out what's wrong with them, get them the medication and treatment that they need, and successfully get them back to full health. So pictured here, you see one of our veterinarians actually doing an ultrasound on a sea otter. So anything that can be done for a person at a human hospital, we can essentially do for marine mammals as well, whether that's surgery or taking x-rays or giving stitches, you name it, we can do it for marine mammals. And then along the way, of course, we're doing our research. We really are trying to advance global ocean conservation. So we want to understand why marine mammals are getting sick, how we can innovate marine mammal medicine, and what implications there might be for human health or public health as well. And we're even partnering with veterinarians from around the world and other rescue centers around the world. We're part of a huge global network. Of course, the ultimate goal is release. We want those patients to go happy, healthy, back to the ocean. So pictured here, you're seeing some chubby harbor seals returning back to the ocean after successfully being rehabilitated at the Marine Mammal Center. And then, of course, what Diane and I spend our time doing is education. We can rescue, rehabilitate, release all day long, but if people don't know about the struggles that marine mammals have or the, the importance of our shared ocean ecosystem with marine mammals, then we're not going to have as big an impact as we could. So we have lots of great educational programs, and while the center is closed to the public right now, we have lots of virtual opportunities. So make sure to check out our website, marinemammalcenter.org, if you haven't yet, for virtual programs. We even have curriculum and lots of awesome online activities. All right, so let's kick it off with some trivia. So Laura and I have five questions total for this game. Um, there'll be different types of questions. So our first one is a true or false. So what you'll do to participate is just type in your answer in the comments. So for true, false, you can either type in true or false or T or F. Um, we do have some kind of fill in the blank answers uh, where you get to type it out and give it your own guess. Um, and we'll give you a couple seconds to, to answer in the comments. And then uh, do remember to tell your points. So if you want to grab a little sheet of paper or just memorize it, um, because we do have some fun rankings at the end. All right. So for our first question, we thought it would be appropriate to ask um, this question. Is it true or false that the Marine Mammal Center rescues sharks? True or false, the Marine Mammal Center rescues sharks. And bonus points if you can identify the shark in this diagram. <laughs> and speaking of sharks, Diane, do you have a, a favorite shark? Ooh, well, I do have a scalloped hammerhead shark in my background. So I'm a fan of those guys. Uh, they just look so interesting. And I feel like they're so graceful in the water when you see pictures, pictures of them underwater. Um, I obviously love my great whites, white sharks, um, and um, I also am a fan of whale sharks. I just found out they have teeth on their eyeballs, so that's wow. fun and interesting. <laughs> well, those are all really good choices for favorite sharks. <laughs> So hopefully everyone has had a chance to put their answer in for true or false. We're going to reveal the answer now. And it is false. So if you answered that, you are correct. Um, the Marine Mammal Center does not rescue sharks. We rescue only marine mammals and the occasional sea turtle, even though they're not marine mammals either. Um, but sharks, even though they resemble some marine mammals like dolphins and whales, they are actually part of the cartilaginous fish family, 
or chondric fees. And then if you guessed that this, um, the image of this shark was a great white shark, you are correct. So you can give yourself maybe a half point for that. <laughs> well done. <laughs> awesome. So another true false question here for number two. True or false, shark bites are the most common ailment at the center. So we've got some animals pictured here that have little shark bites on them. So the question is true or false, shark bites are the most common ailment at the Marine Mammal Center. And Laura, could you tell us maybe what type of marine mammal we're seeing in this picture? Yes, so this is a little harbor seal that we rescued last year named Amonita, and she has a few of those little shark bite wounds that you can see pictured here. So this is a harbor seal. All right, the answer is false. So shark bites are not the most common ailment at the Marine Mammal Center. We actually see most of our patients at the center due to things like malnutrition or just being not getting enough food and being undernourished. So thankfully, though, for any patients at the Marine Mammal Center that do come in with shark bites, it's pretty treatable so long as, you know, depending on the severity. So we'll do things like give antibiotics to make sure that they're not getting any infection, that they're very healthy. We'll flush out that wound as well and remove any dead tissue or dead skin, just, again, to avoid any infection, make sure that wound is nice and clean. And then what we'll also do is we actually won't sew up that wound. So normally when you see kind of a bigger wound, you might think, oh, you'd want to give stitches. But in our case, because our, our marine mammals rehabilitate in saltwater pens, that saltwater that's in their pool is actually antibacterial. It's very healing and it's going to help continue to flesh out that wound and make sure it's healing properly. Thank you, Laura. That was super interesting, How learning how we treat our shark bites at the Marine Mammal Center. Um, a related question, we have a fill in the blank this time. Which shark bites do you think are the most common at the Marine Mammal Center? So even though they're not the most common ailment, we do see them. So which types of shark bites do you think we see the most? Um, and I do want to point out, so I'm pictured on the right is one of our past patients, Jenya. And Jenya, even though he's got a pretty big shark, uh, shark bite wound on his flipper there, um, I do want to point out that he was released uh, just a couple weeks after rescue. So he uh, recovered really fast and did really great in care and was able to go back to his ocean home safely. And Laura, you, do you have a favorite type of shark? So I have a couple. I'm actually a big fan of the sharks that we can find in San Francisco Bay. So there's one really special one called the Broadnose Seven Gill Shark that's in San Francisco Bay. And it's unique because when we think of most species of sharks, they have five gill slits. But the seven gill, obviously by its name, has seven gill slits. So they're a very um, almost prehistoric shark. And they're also really gentle, calm. They have beautiful colors kind of a dark gray and black speckles. I think they're really unique. <laughs> nice. That's so cool. All right. So hopefully you had enough time to fill in the blank which shark bites are the most common. And the answer is... So if you answered white shark bites or and or cookie cutter shark bites, um, you get a point. And they are, so they're the two most common shark bites by far that we see at the Marine Mammal Center. Um, so great white sharks, if you live in California, you're probably, you probably know that they do uh, roam our waters and they do feed on marine mammals. So we will often see um, great white shark bites um, on our patients, which was the case with Jenya, the patient pictured in the previous slide, and also the same patient pictured here. This was Jenya when he was getting released back to the ocean. And you can see that shark bite wound healed up really nicely, and this was only in uh, a couple weeks. So those larger wounds, generally the great white sharks are responsible for them. 
And then on the left here, we have a cookie cutter shark. And though they look really scary here, kind of, you know, that same pose as the great white shark, they are much smaller creatures. So their maximum length is only two to three feet long. And they're called the cookie cutter sharks because they use those really sharp, tiny teeth that you see on the picture here to take out circular bites out of prey. And they really like marine mammals. So um, you see this northern elephant seal on the bottom left corner has got some cookie cutter shark bites. So it's those little circular wounds. Um, they're not dangerous to marine mammals since they're so small. Um, probably feel a little bit like mosquito bites um, and they mostly take out, you know, blubber. So it's not much of a danger to marine mammals, but we will see them on mostly our elephant seals and then sometimes whales as well. Yes, so lucky our marine mammals have that thick layer of blubber or fat that serves lots of purposes, keeps them nice and warm in the cold ocean environment, but can also protect them from kind of exterior scrapes or wounds or even shark bites. <laughs> All right, so we have another true false here. Sharks have marine mammal predators. So we're turning the tables around here. True or false, sharks have marine mammal predators. What do you think? Type true or false into the comments here. And so Laura, could you tell us what this species on the right is, perhaps? Yes, I picked this picture because I just love the pose. Like, oh my goodness, predators. <laughs> so this is a sea otter, one of our patients that we do treat at the Marine Mammal Center as well. But sea otters are definitely not a desirable food for sharks. Just like we were talking about in the last slide with blubber, that's really what the sharks are looking for, that high fat, high protein meal. And sea otters, while they look really um, like they might have blubber and they live certainly in very cold ocean environments, they're actually mostly fur. They have hardly any blubber at all. They've got the, they're the furriest animal in the world, actually. Sharks would not, uh, enjoy a bite out of a sea otter, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, so it is true that sharks have marine mammal predators. So often when we think about sharks as top predators, we think of that iconic great white shark, but there are lots of different species of shark. And pictured here, we actually have an example of a shark called a leopard shark, which you see in San Francisco Bay, that get up to around six feet long or so, which is nothing in comparison to a full adult male California sea lion, which can get up to over 800 pounds. So these are big marine mammals and they can easily take down sharks. So they do have uh, marine mammal predators. And then pictured on the right here, I have the orca or the killer whale, which is a marine mammal. And they're known for being kind of the apex, the, the top predator in the ocean food web, taking down great white sharks. So it is true that sharks have marine mammal predators. Very cool. Um, and for our last question now, hope you've been telling your points. Um, this is another true false. So is it true or false that sharks and marine mammals share the same threats? So true or false, sharks and marine mammals share the same threats. And you can see pictured on the right is another scalloped hammerhead shark, which I have in my background. <laughs> And then what about these marine mammals pictured on the left, Diane? What are those? Ah, uh, yeah. So you might remember them from a previous slide. Those are some Pacific Harbor seals. All right. So if you said true, you were correct. Sharks and marine mammals do share some of the same threats. And um, some of these threats include bycatch, illegal poaching, entanglement in nets. Um, over millions of sharks each year get entangled, um, unfortunately. They'll also kill hundreds of thousands of marine mammals like whales, porpoises, and seals and sea lions, um, as well as sea turtles. 
Um, and we'll see actually quite a lot of entanglements at the center. So we respond to entangled whales and entangled seals and sea lions. And unfortunately, sharks are also big victims of entanglements in um, discarded fishnets or also um, gillnets. So as sad as those statistics are, fortunately, there are a lot of things that we can do um, supporting sustainable seafood and sustainable fishing methods. Um, supporting local seafood is also really great. Uh, Marine Mammal Center is partners with Monterey Bay Aquarium's Seafood Watch uh, program, so um, which helps um, kind of build out a network of sustainable seafood um, across industries. So check out their website if you want to learn a little bit more about sustainable seafood and um, how they decide what's sustainable and what is not. Um, the Marine Mammal Center also partners with Pacific Ocean Aqua Farms and the Global Ghost Gear Initiative to prevent those threats that I was talking about um, with marine mammals and fishing. Um, and this also kind of a little byproduct, it also would help sharks um, to build a better world for marine mammals. Another huge thing you can do is just learn more about sharks and marine mammals, support the organizations that protect them and talk about them. Talk about how much you love sharks, all the cool facts you learned uh, about today and um, marine mammals alike, um, and just spread the word, spread the love. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's try and eliminate the kind of bad rap that sharks get. They're so vital to their ecosystems. Just like marine mammals, they each have a role to play. And we certainly have a role to play to maintaining a healthy ocean for them and for us. All right, so if you did tell your points, it's not a competition, but if you did want to see which little category you fall into here, if you scored between zero and two points, maybe you're feeling silly. If you scored between three and four points, you're utterly amazing. And if you scored five points or more, we did give out some half points earlier today. <laughs> so if you scored five or more points, you are simply awesome. So great job, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This was a lot of fun. And thank you, Diane, for helping out today. Oh, my God. Thank you, Laura. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, everyone, for participating today. And make sure to check out marinemammalcenter.org if you haven't had a chance. We've got lots of great virtual programs to join and as well as tons of resources. If you want to know more about the impacts on marine mammals or more about shark bites in marine mammals, check out that website. I hope you learned a lot and enjoyed today. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Hello everyone, and welcome to the California Academy of Sciences. My name is Alex, and I hope you're having a wonderful Sharktoberfest so far. Now here at the California Academy of Sciences, we have hundreds of sharks, both as live animals and as specimens in our collections. Specimens like those fossilized megalodon teeth you saw just now. Now sharks are incredible animals, and they've been on this earth for about 450 million years. That's older than most trees have been around. Now to tell you a little bit more about these amazing animals, I'm going to pass it on to our volunteer Shreya, who will be talking about these sharks as they just get started out. Hello everyone, my name is Shreya and I'm a docent here at the California Academy of Sciences. And today I wanted to share a few cool tidbits about one of my favorite ocean creatures, sharks. So are you ready to dive underwater with me? Let's get started. So when you hear baby shark, perhaps this is what pops into your head. Baby shark do 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 baby shark do 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 baby shark do do Well, as fun as that song is, have you ever wondered how baby sharks actually come to be? I'm going to introduce you to a few sharks and show you two of the ways that they produce their babies. Let's start with the first group, the ones that lay eggs. Okay, so when you think of an egg, this is probably what you're imagining, right? This is your regular chicken egg, oval shape with a hard shell and yellow yolk inside. But what about this? Any guesses what this could be? 
How about this one? Do you believe it if I said it was an egg sac? Shark eggs may not look at all like the ones you use to make an omelet, but just like the inside of a chicken egg, you can see the yolk sac in the middle where the baby shark gets all of its nutrients. These shark eggs are actually known as mermaid's purses. Cool name, huh? The parts that stick out on either side are called tendrils. So sharks that lay these eggs do not stick around to take care of them. So to make sure that the eggs don't drift away into the ocean, these tendrils actually help the eggs attach to things like kelp. So that keeps the eggs safe, camouflaged, and away from predators. Here's a few of the sharks that lay eggs like the ones I just showed you. On the left, we have the Wobegon shark. On the right, we have a young bamboo shark. Then we have a swell shark, which you can actually see at the academy. Now let's go on to group number two, the ones that give birth to live babies. Can you think of other animals that perhaps do the same? How about whales? Dogs, perhaps? There's several more of these examples. And of course, us. Now, this group of sharks has all of the celebrity names and perhaps the most famous one of them is the great white shark. White shark babies develop as eggs inside the mama shark and they hatch inside and will be born alive into the water. So they don't produce the eggs that I showed you previously. Some of the other celebrity sharks in this group, maybe you'll recognize some of them. The one in the center looks familiar, right? Has a hammer in the front, it's a hammerhead shark. The one on the left is a lemon shark. The one on the right is a tiger shark. And there's many more famous members of this group of sharks. So are you ready to be a shark scientist? Maybe you'll be inspired by this book on Eugenie Clark. You'll read how Eugenie broke a lot of barriers as a woman scientist to show the world how cool sharks really are. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you, Shreya. And now at the California Academy of Sciences, our sharks exhibit is open if you'd like to learn more about these wonderful denizens of the deep. Here in the exhibit, you can take a look at impressive jaws, fossils, and specimens from these amazing creatures and learn about how they affect the world and why we still need them and want to protect them. My name is Jenny Stock and I'm with the Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary and I'm going to share with you a little bit about the special place off the Marin Sonoma Coast and a little bit about the sharks that we've seen while doing research out in the sanctuary. Cordell Bank is an offshore sanctuary and it's right between the Greater Farallons and um, northern areas and southern areas. It was designated in 1989 and originally to protect the Cordell Bank itself. Cordell Bank is this big mass of rock between, um, it's about eight and a half miles long by four and a half miles wide and reaches up into the water column to just about 115 feet below the surface. And this is a temperate rocky reef that's just incredibly dense with marine life and it is worthy of protection. The sanctuary expanded in about 2015 along with the Greater Farallon Sanctuary and with that came different habitats of deeper waters. The Dega Canyon was brought into the sanctuary, as well as some deeper areas that are on the western edge of the continental shelf. So you look at those that map and it looks like a bunch of little rivers. So these areas we just started to explore um, after the designation or the expansion happened in 2015. And I'm gonna share with you some of the pictures from those areas today. We do a lot of our work through remotely operated vehicles. These are underwater robots that have the technology to help us see what the seafloor looks like at great depths. It's a very efficient way to learn about the ocean and learn about the seafloor and everything that lives there. 
There are there's sampling equipment, so we can grab samples if we need to for identification purposes. And there is a live video feed that comes up through the tether onto the ship so we can record all the information that we are gaining through those cameras. So Cordell Bank itself is the shallowest part of the sanctuary and the prettiest as well. These are invertebrate covered reefs that have very dense invertebrate life. So there's strawberry anemones, there are sponges, there's hydroids, pretty much every square inch is covered on those upper parts of the reefs. As you go down deeper, there's less plankton in the water, so there's a little bit less settling out on those deeper depths, as well as there's less sunlight at those depths as well. So up up high here, you get all this dense invertebrate cover. We also have mobile invertebrates like sea stars and crabs and octopus and snails, and they move around as well here. But one of the cool things that's neat about these living reefs is they attract fish to come hang out near them, either resting in there or hiding or even reproducing. These are juvenile, young of the year rockfish that happen to be hovering very dense in a very dense concentration above the bank. Here's some rosy rockfish too. They're really, really uh, bright, brightly colored. But also on this picture, you can notice there's some uh, pink hydrocoral. And pink hydrocoral is a cold water coral that loves the West Coast. And we have it all the way from Washington to Baja, California, or Baja, Mexico. And this is a coral that um, thrives in plankton-rich waters and tends to be where there's very strong currents just moving lots of water by. So we tend to see this beautiful pink coral in some of the high current areas on Cornell Bank. I like to show this picture because if you really look closely, you can really see a lot of different animals. You might see a crab, you might see some snails and a sea cucumber. Uh, I see some orange cup corals and some different sponges. This is what I call snorkeling at Cordell Bank. Since it's such a deep water area that's very hard to see, some of us have to snorkel through photographs, but this is still fun to see all the different types of animals that live there. So going into the depths, this is down in Bodega Canyon where we have started to investigate to see what lives there. And we really had no idea till 2017 when we first got to go there with the Ocean Exploration Trust and the Exploration Vessel Nautilus. So at these depths, we found some really cool communities of mainly invertebrates, but a couple of vertebrates as well. And the highlight being deep sea corals. These are bamboo corals on the left, and these are um, probably about two feet tall. They might be a little bit taller. These corals can get pretty big. They can also grow to be very old. And they have polyps all over their body that are able to catch marine snow that drift down from the surface of the ocean. Everything that lives up on the surface eventually dies and rains to the seafloor, and that becomes food for a lot of organisms in this deep habitat. So these corals will eat this marine snow, and they have these little tentacles all over to catch that and eat it up. They also become habitat for a lot of other creatures. So there's brittle stars that climb up onto these corals. Sometimes we see crabs or anemones or snails. Um, this picture in the middle here is this type of sponge that's very frilly, and it, that actually was uh, identified to be a brand new species of sponge. We had a sample taken and spent, sent to a sponge taxonomist who found that to be a brand new species, so that was pretty exciting to find. Um, also some octopuses there and anemones and crabs. There's just an amazing array of invertebrate life that is down in these deep, deep depths. There's also a blob sculpin there, which are very well appropriately named for being their blobish selves. <laughs> so this whole area is so productive um, with the upwelling that we have. We're part of the California Current Marine Ecosystem, and that's all the way up north from the coast off Washington and the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary all the way down to Southern California. Just an incredible array of biodiversity because of this upwelling. The upwelling is the driver of the food web, with starting with the phytoplankton and supporting all the other layers of the food web and drawing in predators from far away to come here to eat. We have whales and sharks and seabirds and dolphins and uh, California and big fish and even turtles. They'll come all the way here to eat because the food is so good. So this is one of the contributors that really can support having sharks in the California current is having this really rich food web. So let's check out our sharks. 
So we have seen a couple sharks in Cordell Bank, mainly on our ROV cameras. And so we call these flybys or swimbys because they swim in front of the camera. They're not the highest quality of photo, but they're really cool to see that, wow, we have some sharks. And uh, this is a six field shark. This is, we've seen fairly regularly on our dives. They like to be near the rocky habitat of the bank and they have a blunt nose, kind of flat nose and a nice long line. This is about a six or seven foot shark. And here's a little video. This is from 2008, so it's a little pixelated of a six scale shark approaching the ROV. Um, this is at about 240 feet in depth. So as you can see, not a lot of invertebrate life on those rocks. You can really see the granite there. And there's the shark. You can see how their pectoral fins, big eye, and they're not a big fan of the camera, so they take off. So six gill sharks have a sixth gill. Most sharks have five, but they have six, and there's even a seven gill shark, but we haven't seen one of those yet at Cordell. We also have seen salmon sharks, and I think actually only once we've seen salmon shark. Salmon sharks are usually a bit more uh, common up in Alaska, but I know they live throughout California as well. They are very frequently confused as juvenile white sharks because they have a very similar body shape and coloration and have that explosive power that white sharks do. They are in the same family. Salmon sharks sometimes have a real like mottled bot, um, underside, so not just white. They usually have like lots of um, circles and different colorations and marks, um, but they're fairly small as a shark. They typically follow schooling fish. They also eat salmon. And um, every once in a while, one will wash up on the beaches and people think it's a white shark, but it's actually a salmon shark. So we were able to see one in an ROV same year, 2008. And it was somewhat random because we weren't quite on habitat. We were in between and um, this shark came into view. Sorry, it's a little pixelated as well. This was at about 100 feet of water, and you can see its nose is just a little different than a white shark. A white shark is really triangular, and this one's a little bit more blunt. You can see the arm of the ROV there. And then it just goes out of view. So that's always really exciting. You know, we're usually focused on looking at Cordell Bank habitat, and to see these big predators on the camera is really exciting for the whole team to see. The other sharks we've seen are actually deeper in the deeper waters of Bodega Canyon that we just got to see just a couple of years ago. And we've seen a couple different types of cat sharks. So cat sharks are just a couple of feet long. They're rather small and slender. They get that cat name because they have a tapetum lucidum that really reflects out light. So when an ROV shines its lights on the cat shark, it really reflects back this green light. They kind of look like cat eyes. But that tapetum lucidum is really helpful because um, some of their favorite foods are mctophids, which are a type of fish that migrate up and down in the water column uh, at night and they bioluminesce. So that might be a way to help them see their prey um, to catch it, is having that ability to, to see that light. They also eat invertebrates on the seafloor as well. Cat sharks are living in rather deep waters that we call the oxygen minimum zone where there isn't a ton of oxygen in the water. And so they have really well-developed kind of accentuated gills to catch as much oxygen as they can in the habitats that they swim in. They also have um, a bit of squalene in their liver, which is a type of material that just helps with their buoyancy. They're living at pretty big depths. And instead of being weighted to the seafloor, that helps give them a little buoyancy for swimming to stay uh, in the right habitat that works for them. So the cat sharks, we've seen a couple different species. Cat sharks, um, egg cases have been seen throughout Cordell Bank and Greater Farallon sanctuaries, which is a great sign because that means these sanctuary habitats are healthy enough for these animals to be reproducing here. And we wanna see more of that, animals having the opportunity to reproduce and live their lives here in these beautiful waters. So this is a long egg case. Sometimes we see skate egg cases that wash up on the beaches because skates are, in the, are also egg laying um, animals. And so the cat shark lays this one egg case and there's a shark developing in there, has a pretty long period of time that it develops in there, but everything it needs is there, the egg yolk and everything. Hatches out and then it's a shark. 
So hopefully that shark attached by now and living a happy life throughout the sanctuary. So we can all help sharks and help the ocean with a few simple things. Well, not so simple, but complicated, but because everybody's working on them together makes it easier. So we need to get involved in reducing climate emissions. Our earth is warming. We know it's because of carbon dioxide emissions that have gotten out of control. And so we all need to work on getting our carbon dioxide emissions down, working together in our communities, uh, working with everybody to help reduce our carbon footprints. We can work on purchasing sustainable seafood from reputable sources. This might take some homework, but you wanna find out which fish are being sold in your stores that are sustainable. And there are a lot of different resources with Seafood Watch and with NOAA to figure out which sources of seafood are the best for helping protect fish, helping reduce bycatch. The other thing you can do that we can all be part of is just sharing your love of the ocean and with sharks and of sharks with others. Spreading the love and awe we have about the ocean just gets other people more excited and engaged and excited to learn more about it and to help protect it. So please do that either by sharing Sharktoberfest videos or other cool things about the ocean that you really love. And then we can all take better care of the ocean together. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something new about this amazing part of our world off the coast of California. And today I'll also be sharing a video showing how to draw a shark. So stay tuned for that. Take care. Hey everybody, it's Jenny Stock again with Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And we're gonna do a quick lesson in drawing sharks. So if you wanna um, play along and do the drawing with me, take a minute to get a piece of paper and a pencil. Uh, an eraser is a really helpful thing to have. And I will take you step by step for learning how to draw a shark. Now, I'm not an, an artist and I've seen some really great drawings of sharks, but I'm just, you know, I'm an educator and I'm actually at a keyboard most of the time, but I thought it'd be fun to show you that anybody can draw a shark um, just by taking it step by step. So join in with me. We're going to do a short fin mako shark and we're going to start with the body and the body is the sort of a torpedo-y shaped body. We'll taper it at the front. And um, that, that's because they're so hydrodynamic. They're really good at propelling through the water and they can just cut through the water with that nice shape. If they were boxy, they're not so great. Like a whale shark's kind of boxy, but even them, they have some somewhat of a torpedo shape too. All right, so we got the body. It doesn't look like a shark yet, but just wait. So the next part is the caudal fin, which is the tail fin back here which is a big part of how they propel their bodies through the water. So for the short fin mako, we're gonna do a nice coddle here, coming down. And the nice thing with pencil, right? It's so forgiving, you can kind of move around with it, you can erase. Like I see this, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna erase that. Now it's gone. Kids, you can look busy in school if you just practice drawing sharks when you're listening. And then, um, let's see, then we have the dorsal fin. So the dorsal fin is like midway up the body. And for the short fin mako, it's a little bit of an angle. And, and then it goes like down. Might be a little bit bigger than this. Let's do this. For this body shape. This is the thing, it's just practice, it's not perfect, right? And then I'll do a little color. And just as I'm drawing the dorsal fin here, I'm thinking, wow, you know, white sharks have such a different dorsal fin, and uh, leopard sharks and thresher sharks, like each dorsal fin is so different. So drawing really gets you to notice these things if you're drawing from pictures or, or whatnot. All right, now we have a pectoral fin to draw, which is um, down here, and it's usually like right in front of the dorsal fin. And there's two, but we're just gonna draw one because of the view that we're drawing here of this shark. And it goes like this. And I'm just gonna go ahead and color it a little bit and just give it a little shading, because you'll see what I'm gonna do some counter shading at the end. 
And pectoral fins, they have two of these. They're real stabilizers for them when they're swimming. Help, they, when, you know, when you see a shark swimming underwater, you see they, these great pectoral fins. It's kind of like airplane wings. Now I'm realizing in proportion here, the pectoral fin should probably be a little bit more this way. I'm actually gonna just take off a little bit here. This is the, one of the fun things you just get to practice over and over again. All right, then we're gonna do the rest of the fins. So sharks have other fins. They don't just have these. They actually have a secondary dorsal. This is a, a short fin mako and it has a little one down here. And then it has an anal fin, which is just here. And it also has a pelvic fin. Now, if you were a male shark, you'd have claspers sticking out and they have those for mating with females to make more sharks. But we're just gonna keep it as a female shark for now. And then gills, they swim in, underwater and they get oxygen out of the water through their gills. So this shark has five gills right there. And then we have to do an eye and the eye is up here. We're gonna do a nice little round eye like that. And then a mouth. And uh, you know, we're not gonna open the mouth right now. That would be another drawing. So that is the basic drawing of a shark. And you know, it's just so fun to pick up a pencil and start sketching our favorite animals. And you can share your drawings with your friends and promote shark awareness, letting them know how amazing these creatures are, how important they are as part of our ecosystem, how we really need to take action to help protect them and, uh, and have fun. So I'm doing a little counter shading here, a little darker on top because a lot of sharks have this counter shading as a way to kind of hide from predators that might be above them. And so they're a little darker on top and lighter on the bottom. So if you were looking up above from below, they would kind of blend in with the lighter waters above them. Looking down, a little bit darker. There's your shark. So thanks for watching. I hope you guys drew a shark with me at the same time. Happy Sharktober. Please spread the word for helping out sharks and taking care of our ocean. That's it for now.
Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back. We've got a great lineup in this next segment. We have the Marine Science Institute highlighting leopard sharks and their adaptations, followed by a tour of shark research gear and data collecting techniques from Jasmine Graham, shark researcher at Florida's Moat Marine Laboratory and co-founder of Minorities in Shark Sciences. And after that, chalk artist and longtime Sharktoberfest collaborator and contributor, Madison Clell is gonna share this year's chalk art masterpiece that was inspired by her own white shark encounter. After hearing from Madison, we'll have another musical number by the sanctuary's own Max Delaney. Hello, and welcome from the Marine Science Institute, located right on the San Francisco Bay in the port of Redwood City, California. Our location allows us to conduct educational programs and includes many exciting features like our on-site aquarium and our 90-foot research vessel, the Robert G. Brownlee. At the Marine Science Institute, we work with all kinds of marine life that lives in the San Francisco Bay. Our mission is to cultivate a responsibility for the natural environment and our human communities through interdisciplinary science education. We collect a wide variety of animals on our ship that help us educate our students like bat rays, sculpin, flounder, and our favorite animal ambassador, the leopard shark. California is home to 40 species of shark and other cartilaginous fish. Leopard sharks is one of the most abundant. Sharks tend to get a bad rap, but like most of the 500 plus species of sharks, leopard sharks are gentle and harmless. Today, we're gonna to tell you a little bit about leopard sharks and their cartilaginous relatives. Before we can dive into leopard sharks fully, however, we need to learn a little bit about their habitat. Leopard sharks live in the Pacific Ocean, but breed in the San Francisco Bay. The San Francisco Bay is an estuary, which means a body of water that is mostly surrounded by land and has rivers that meet a sea or ocean. Our bay has cold salt water coming in from the Pacific Ocean, which is mixing with fresh water from the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers, or more commonly known as the Delta. This mixture of salty and fresh water is called brackish water. Additionally, the bay is really shallow in some parts, making specific areas a perfect nursery for leopard sharks, as well as many other fish, sharks, skates, rays, and even harbor seals. Most of these animals will grow up in the bay and move into the ocean once they are bigger, returning to their breeding areas in the bay and starting the cycle over again. Unlike humans, sharks have no bones. Their skeletons are made of cartilage, meaning they are elasma breaks. Cartilage is in our bodies too. It helps make up our ears and our nose, and it protects our joints. Sharks' cartilage helps them stay light and flexible, so they are able to move through the water more efficiently. Additionally, unlike humans whose teeth are attached to their jaws, sharks' teeth are attached to their gums, which means they shed them often. A shark can lose up to 30,000 teeth in their lifetime. Because of this, they have rows and rows of teeth ready to move up any time a tooth is lost. So you, you can see here, we have a broken tooth. If this dusky shark was still alive, that tooth right there would take its place. Also, unlike humans, sharks are born with their teeth, ready for chomping. We've mentioned how sharks are different from humans, but let's talk briefly about how chondrichthys are different from other fish. Again, the major difference is going to be that cartilaginous skeleton. The majority of fish are considered osteichthys, which simply means they have a bony skeleton, such as tuna, salmon, and goldfish. Other differences, which you will see momentarily, are special adaptations, such as electrical receptors and spiracles. Bony fish also have swim bladders used for buoyancy that they fill with air, whereas sharks, with the aid of an oily liver, use propulsion to move up and down through the water column. Most bony fish have scales to protect themselves, while sharks have dermal denticles, which translates to teeth skin. Sharks are incredibly hydrodynamic due to this amazing adaptation. Looking more closely at some leopard shark skin allows us to see tiny placoid scales or dermal denticles. 
What makes this translation from dentical to teeth really interesting is that while shark scales are shaped like teeth, they are also made of dentin and covered with enamel, the same substance that makes up animal teeth. And like animal teeth, dermal denticles have different shapes and sizes, each corresponding to a different function. Denticles are like naturally occurring chain mail armor, protecting the sharks against predators, abrasions, and parasites that could attach to their skin. When we catch leopard sharks on our ship, we often find parasites attached inside their gill slits or on their eyes. These are the few places parasites can attach to. Denticles also decrease drag and turbulence, allowing the shark to swim faster and quietly. The fastest shark is the mako shark, related to salmon sharks and the iconic great white shark. This is a head from a mako shark. This is actually a, this is a small mako shark um, or a young mako shark. Mako sharks get a little bit bigger than this. Let's see if we can check out its dermal denticles. So it looks like the microscope is having a, a tough time focusing on its denticles. But if you can see, they are substantially smaller than that of our leopard shark skin and shaped differently. Denticles size and shape change depending on the body location. Again, form and function. Because of that, it makes it difficult, if not impossible, to identify a shark from dermal denticles alone. Like all other sharks, leopard sharks also have their skeleton all made up of cartilage, and the only part that they really have is going to be their teeth. So if you take a look at them out, you can see their tiny little teeth. And they have many, many rows of teeth that they will replace over their entire lifetime. And right next to their teeth, they also have one of their six senses. They have something called ampullae borzines. They're a bunch of little dots right next to their mouth and on their nose. And those are actually used to sense electromagnetic field of other animals and creatures living in the water. Another sense that sharks have is a lateral line. And this is a line that we can actually see goes all the way down their body. And they can actually use this to sense movement in the water. So they're actually feeling water pressure moving around next to them as other creatures are swimming around. And schooling fish or schooling sharks can actually use this to help swim together in a group without bumping around uh, next to each other into other animals. Leopard sharks, like some other cartilaginous fish, are ovoviviparous. During this specialized birthing process, the baby leopard sharks develop in eggs inside a female shark's body. Unlike many egg-laying species, leopard sharks emerge from their eggs while still in their mother's body, their umbilical cords still attached to their yolk sacs. Female leopard sharks can birth up to 33 pups, each measuring 8 to 9 inches long. California bat rays, another native San Francisco chondrichthys, are also ovoviviparous and come out of the womb curled up like little cannolis. Let's join Ashley on the ship and learn about another one of our favorite elasmobranchs, the California bat ray. Welcome to the RV Robert G. Brownlee. We are sitting on the back deck right now, or the stern of the ship, and what I have for you here is another one of our cartilaginous animals. This is a bat ray. It's related to sharks and rays because it also has that cartilaginous skeleton. So unlike our bony fish, it actually has cartilage making up its whole skeleton. And this one also has something really neat just behind its eyes. You can actually see something extra that they have that helps them breathe. Right here, just behind the bat ray's eyes, you can see these little holes, and these are actually called spiracles, and this is something that leopard sharks have as well. And this is something connected to their gills that actually helps them get more oxygen and more water flowing over their gills. So if you've ever heard the myth that sharks need to keep swimming in order to breathe, that's actually not true for bat rays and leopard sharks because they have this extra organ that helps them get more oxygen flowing to their gills. They can actually spend extended periods of time down at the bottom of the bay, resting or looking for their prey. If we actually flip this guy over, we can actually see their gills on their belly right over here. Again, those spiracles are connected to their gills, helping pump extra water and oxygen. You can also see a little bit of this guy's mouth. And if you notice, you might not actually be able to see any teeth in their mouth because bat rays actually don't have teeth. 
So instead of teeth like sharks, they actually have bony plates that they use to crush their food and their prey. We catch most of our leopard sharks on our ship, and while the majority are released immediately, a few are kept as animal ambassadors to share with students like you. Before long, we release the sharks back into the wild, but not before we attach these yellow tags to their bodies. These tags alert fisher people or others who may catch them to contact us about their size and location. This way we can track their movement throughout the bay. We have been running this specific tagging program since the 1970s. During our shoreside program, Discovery Voyage, and Fish and Shark Inland Voyages, students and campers get the chance to become marine biologists by visiting, touching, asking questions, and making their own observations about leopard sharks and other marine life. At Marine Science Institute, our goal is to give students valuable hands-on experiences with marine life, teach them about our local bay organisms and environment, and encourage their own scientific and critical thinking skills. We offer a diverse list of programs for students, families, and teachers that can be viewed on our website at www.sfbaymsi.org. Please email us at info at sfbaymsi.org with questions or if you are interested in one of our programs. We can't wait to see you. My name is Jasmine Graham and I am a marine scientist. I specialize in elasmobranchs, which are sharks, skates, and rays. I work at the intersection of social justice, science education, and scientific research because I think that they are all important pieces of the conservation puzzle. I grew up and was always interested in the ocean coming from a fishing family, coming from a family that's on the coast, coastal community, uh, really attached to the ocean. And I was interested in it in a way that kind of went beyond my family, where I had questions about what was happening outside of we get food from the ocean. Uh, there's a whole world in the ocean and I always had questions about it. I went to a summer camp where I learned that marine science was a thing that you could do for a job. And when I learned that I could potentially get paid to try and figure out some of the answers to these questions I'd already always been curious about, I thought, sign me up. The biggest challenge that I faced was just knowing where to go and what to do. Um, so, coming from a family where no one has done science research, um, that, was, that was hard. There was definitely a lot of concern on the, the part of my parents when I said that I wanted to do marine science because, you know, a nurse they knew about, police officer they knew about, military they knew about, trades they knew about, but they didn't know about marine science. And so it was kind of the, the challenge of walking on a path that no one that I knew had walked before. My research is on a critically endangered species, and critically endangered is the step right before extinction. So it's as bad off as a species can be without being declared extinct. And so I'm studying their movements so that I can hopefully provide information to policymakers about where they're spending a lot of time, what habitats are important to them, so that we can be sure to protect those mm -hmm. habitats. One time I was out um fishing we were looking for sawfish caught a big lemon shark working up a lemon shark which in and of itself is i mean i do that all the time so it doesn't seem very wild to me but the fact that i am you know working up a shark on a boat that's super abnormal for the average person and uh we have this lemon shark and it actually bit our boat so it bit the hydraulic steering cable uh, of our boat. And 
fluid was spewing everywhere. It was a whole thing. Uh, once the le once lemon sharks latch down, they don't really let up. Uh, so it's just it's just latched. Um, and we finally managed to get it off, get it worked up, get it back in the water. Now we're trying to fix the boat. Um, fluid is spewing everywhere. I can't steer because one of the engines it has lost so much steering fluid that it won't turn. And we have, of course, got to keep hauling the line. So we put some duct tape on it, refilled the fluid, ho hoped that it hold. And um, I tried to steer as little as possible to not aggravate the problem. And there I was in the middle of Florida Bay, driving half uh, driving a boat with one out of two engines working, <laughs> trying to catch sharks. And we just kind of had to keep going. And that is pretty much my work in a nutshell in the field is you never know what's going to happen. You got to roll with the punches. You're out in the middle of, of the ocean or, you know, in the middle of the bay. And you just got to figure stuff out and get creative. <laughs> if someone is interested in marine science, go and find your people. Go and find a support system, people that are going to believe in you, people that have been on this journey and can guide you. Finding those people is super important and finding them as early as possible is important. And some ways to go about doing that is to just try and be, to quote Hamilton, be in the room where it happens. Hi everyone, welcome to the virtual field survey. My name is Jasmine Graham and I am the president and CEO of Minorities in Shark Sciences. And today I'm gonna to be walking you through what it looks like whenever we do one of our field surveys to study sharks and rays. So I'll start off by talking about the anatomy which is very important when we're thinking about how to identify different species. So here are some of the major external features of sharks. So we have our first dorsal fin right in the front there. If you've seen Jaws or any other shark movie, that's the fin that's usually sticking out of the surface whenever people start panicking about there being a shark, which by the way, you don't need to panic if there's a shark. They live there, they're supposed to be there. Then we have our second dorsal fin. Uh, so most sharks have two dorsal fins, but not all. Some sharks only have one dorsal fin. They only have the second dorsal. They don't have the first dorsal, but most of them do have two fins. So we have the first dorsal, which is the closest to the head, and the second dorsal, which is the closest to the tail. Speaking of the tail, we call the tail the caudal fin. So that is what the tail is called. That little bit where the body meets the tail is called the peduncle, which is a fun word to say, peduncle. Most sharks have a fork in their tail where they have a clearly defined top lobe and bottom lobe, and the fork is where that kind of splits. We have the anal fin, which is usually near the, uh, below the second dorsal, uh, we have the pelvic fins, which are just in front of the anal fin, and then we have the pectoral fin, which, which are our fins that are in the very front. And then, of course, we have our gills. Most sharks and rays have five gill slits. There are a few that have six or seven, uh, and they're so special that they have six or seven gills in their name, typically. And then, of course, in the front, we have the shark's mouth and eyes and snout. So some of the ways that we identify different sharks is with these features, the positioning of the fins, the coloration of the body, the shape of the snout, the shape of the body. Those are some of the ways that we can identify different species. Whenever we need to tell whether a shark is a male or a female, or a ray is a, ma a male or a female, we look at the pelvic fins, which remember are those 
fins that are between the pectoral fins and the anal fin if the shark has an anal fin. Not all of them have a clearly defined anal fin, but these are our pelvic fins, which are where kind of our pelvis is. That's how you could think about it. Think of where the pelvis of a shark might be, and that is where the pelvic fins are. And we see here we have claspers, which are these little protrusions on the pelvic fins. And those are used for mating. The male sharks will have claspers. The female sharks will not have claspers. So you can see the female on one side. She doesn't have claspers. You can see the male on the other side. That is the way that you could tell the difference between the sexes. For mature sharks, so sharks that have reached adulthood, the claspers are calcified, meaning that if you touch them, they are hard and not as flexible and bendy. That's how you can tell whether a male has matured or not. All right, let's talk about some of the gear that we use to catch these magnificent creatures. So we have what's called a ganjin, and we have the tuna clip, the snap at the top, and that's how we connect the ganjin to the gear. So we're gonna talk about the different types that I use in my research. Of course, we have the long uh, line monofilament with the hook at the end. The hook is where we put the bait. That's where the shark is gonna go for the bait. They're gonna get stuck on the hook and that's how we're gonna pull them in. We use a very specific hook because we want to make sure that we minimize the chances of it getting gut hooked or hooked in a way that's gonna hurt it. Uh, so we use a very specific type of hook and we attach this ganjin to a couple of pieces of equipment we can use. One piece that I use most of the time is a long line, which is what it sounds like, a long line. So you can see we have a bunch of ganjins attached to this long piece of line. At one end, we have an anchor. At the other end, we have an anchor. And that keeps the line from sitting at the bottom. This is the, called a bottom long line because it sits at the bottom. So this is for our sharks that are spending a lot of time at the bottom, our rays, things like that. They want to be uh, getting bait from the bottom, not the surface, from the bottom. So we use that type of gear that's called a long line, which allows us to deploy multiple hooks at the same time and increase our chances of catching a shark or a ray. Now you might be wondering why there's so much line on these ganjins. Well, there are some sharks, not all, but some, that are what we call obligate ram ventilators, which means that they have to keep swimming to breathe. So we wanna give them enough line to keep swimming around so that they can continue breathing if they are a type of shark that needs to keep swimming to breathe. This also is important because it helps them avoid predators, uh, so they have some distance and it also keeps them so they can be separated from each other uh, because we don't want anyone getting into any fights or anything while, we're, while they're on the long line. So this makes sure that they have space to move around, do what they need to do, avoid predators and all of that. We also might attach a ganjin to what's called a drum line, which is one single weight, which we call the drum that you see at the bottom here. The ganjin attaches to that. Typically we use this if we're looking to catch a pretty big shark. This lets us have a really, really long ganjin so they can do a lot more swimming around because the bigger they are, the more space they're gonna need to move around to not get stressed out. So this is where we would use a drum line. And of course we only have one ganjin on this one. Uh, so we are deploying multiples of these at a time. So we are going for bigger sharks versus the long line, we would typically be getting a little bit smaller sharks, but we'd be getting them in much larger quantities because we're putting a lot of ganjins on the line. Another method that we use is the gill net, and we use a bottom gill net. So there are weights on one end and floats on the other, and we deploy this. We have an anchor on either side, so the bottom of the gill net is gonna stay on the, on the sea floor and the float is going to float the top of the gill net up. So it is going to take up the whole water column. 
And this type of gear is useful for doing surveys because any animal that swims through that area that is of the proper size based on the size of the holes in the gill net, they are going to get into the gill net. So it's a good way to measure or count all of the species of that size class in an area. Gill nets are uh, banned in certain state waters because of this, because they catch everything in that uh, size class it's going to go through. So they're banned commercially in a lot of different states, not all states, but a lot of different states. And this is because if you leave a gill net in the water too long, you are at risk of killing a bunch of things, getting a lot of bycatch, which means you catch something accidentally that you're not trying to catch. So we use the gill nets for our scientific surveys, but we sit there and watch them the whole time. So uh, we want to make sure that there's nothing in there that's getting caught accidentally and is going to die or anything like that. So we stay by it and we also leave it in there for a very short amount of time and we're constantly checking it. Uh, so this is a good type of gear to use if you're trying to get a big picture of all the species in an area, but it does require a lot of, of extra effort on our part because we want to make sure that we're not accidentally harming things. Uh, and so we're going to have to constantly keep a vigilant look on it, uh, whereas the bottom long line is just kind of sitting at the bottom. And then we come back and check it in an hour or so. Another way that we can catch sharks and rays is doing hook and line, which is if you've been fishing is probably how you went fishing. You got a, a rod and reel, you cast it out, see what you catch. Uh, so this is usually what we use if we can see the animal. We have a pretty good idea that it's that it's there, uh, and we want to just see if we can catch it real quick. Uh, but our other techniques are more to get a wide range of species or to up our chances of getting a rare species. All right, so let's talk about some of the samples and data that we take. We will sex the animal, so we'll identify whether it's a male or a female. We'll take certain measurements. We will tag it, uh, different types of tags we'll talk about in a second. We'll look at its reproductive status. Do we think it's mature or immature? And then when we release it, we also record its release condition. So was it excellent? Was it swimming away super great? Was it good? Was it fair? So we want to record that to make sure that our animals when we're releasing them are in a good condition. So the first thing that we do is we measure the shark. So there are a couple of measurements that we take. One is total length, which goes from the tip of the snout to the edge of the caudal fin, which is our tail fin. And then we do our pre-caudal length, our PCL, and that goes from the snout to the peduncle, which remember is that little connection between the, the body and the tail. Uh, some people call it a little ankle. It's like a little ankle there. Uh, and then we have our fork length, which goes from the tip of the nose to that fork in the tail, where it clearly separates into an upper lobe and a lower lobe. So those are some of the, the measurements that we take that, that helps us keep track of the sizes of different animals in an area. If we have a recapture, we can measure the difference between when we first caught it and now to kind of estimate how fast it's growing. And we use that to calculate growth rates for different species. So there's a lot of different reasons why we would take measurements of the sharks. For our rays, we also do what's called disc width. So rays have a disc where their pectoral fins have kind of been enlarged and elongated to form like this wing-like structure that we call a disc. So we measure that as well. And that goes from one end to the other. Uh, so it's like the width of the ray. We also will collect blood. Sometimes we'll do fin clips, biopsies, and sometimes we'll even take an ultrasound. So the reason why we take blood is we're looking at stress levels. So there's certain hormones in the blood that can indicate different things. So we have our hormones like reproduction, uh, which are testosterone and estradiol. 
uh, which indicate the maturity level, if they've recently mated, if they're preparing to mate, all of those things. And then we also have other elements of the blood chemistry, which will tell us about their stress levels. So we have lactate, which is similar to lactic acid, which we have in ourselves as humans. Uh, and this indicates a lack of oxygen. It means that the body is going through anaerobic respiration. So whenever we have a lactic acid buildup in our bodies, we can get cramps. Um, and we have the ability to pump this out pretty quickly because we have pretty good sized hearts in comparison to the size of our bodies, uh, pretty strong cardiovascular system so we can pump it out. Um, sharks uh, have a more of an issue with buildup because they can't pump it out um, as quickly as we can. So it's important to monitor these levels. Similarly with glucose, uh, glucose levels indicate that they're burning a lot of energy, that their cells are undergoing glycosis, uh, glycolysis, which means that they are expending a lot of energy or have expent a lot of energy, which may indicate stress. Uh, and then we also can look at hematocrit, which is a number of the red blood cells. If you have a lot of red blood cells, that probably means that there was, they were produced because they needed more oxygen, uh, which might indicate stress as well. So we look at this stress to kind of see how stressed they are in their natural environment as a baseline when we first catch them. And then sometimes we'll do it right before we release them to see how stressful the process was. And that's just kind of for us to know about how we need to change our procedures um, and if we need to cut down on anything because we're stressing the animals out. So here is uh, me in the field doing some measurements that I talked about. There's how we measure hematocrit. Uh, you spin it in a centrifuge and all of the red blood cells go to the bottom and the plasma is at the top. We take glucose with a glucose meter, just like we do in people. Uh, and then I use an iStat to measure lactate and some other uh, chemicals in the blood. And then at the bottom there, we have a picture of field school taking some blood from a shark so you can see what it looks like when we draw blood. We'll also take little fin clips. So this is a little um, snippet of the fin. And the reason why we take it from the fin is because they don't have um, a lot of nerves or blood vessels or anything there, so they don't feel it. Uh, so it's kind of like taking a finger clip, uh, a fingernail clipping from you. It's a way for us to get genetics uh, without harming the, the animal. We also sometimes will take a biopsy, uh, which is just a little bit of muscle tissue. And this little punch just allows us to take a little sample of, of muscle tissue without uh, damaging the, the shark a lot. Sharks have, a major, have, have amazing healing abilities, so this doesn't phase them at all. Uh, they will quickly, quickly recover um, from any sort of sampling that we do, uh, but we take the smallest amount as possible from the place where they're not going to feel it, um, and it's not going to cause them as, uh, as much stress. So when we tag the sharks, we use a couple of different tags. Uh, so we have dart tags or roto tags, which are external identification. That's like a dog tag, similar to what you put on your pets. So if someone catches the shark, they see this identification number. It has a phone number that they can call as well, um, and they can call that and get a reward. So if you're ever fishing and you see an animal with one of these tags, be sure to call the number. You can get a reward and you help uh, the scientists. And then we also put pit tags in, which are passive integrated transponders. And those tags are internal. So it's more similar to a microchip where you can put in your dog or your cat. And then if they get lost, they can scan it uh, and identify that animal. The same thing with these pit tags. If we catch an animal again and we scan it and we hear the tag, we know um, what animal that is. And the reason why we might do an internal versus an external is the external is more likely to fall out. Um, but the con of the internal tag is that the only way that you can read it is if you have the little scanner and it's set to the right frequency. So um, that's why we typically use the external ones just so that anyone can see it and identify it. 
Then we also have pop-off satellite archival tags and acoustic transmitters, which we use to actually track the movements of these animals. So the acoustic tags are what you see in the center here. They're about the size of a marker. Uh, you can put them externally. We usually do them internally, so they're less likely to fall out. Uh, they have long battery lives, so they can last anywhere from two to 10 years. And then we have these receivers, which you see in the corner there that are sunk down um, all along the coast. And whenever an animal with a transmitter gets within hearing range of that, it records that and it'll tell you that an animal was here. And then we have our pop-off satellite archival tags, our PSATs, those we apply externally. They're constantly estimating the position of the animal. They put all of that data into the tag itself. And then after a certain number of days, it will pop off, float to the surface, and transmit all of that data to the satellite where the researcher can download it from the comfort of their computer. So in conclusion, the steps of a shark workup. The first thing we do is identify the shark. What is the species? Then we look at the sex. We measure the shark. We collect the samples. We tag the animal and re we release the animal. We do this as quickly as possible to minimize stress on the animal. Uh, so we want to try to do it in a minute or two. If, it's, if we think it's going to take longer, if we do a surgery or anything like that, we'll typically leave them in the water or we'll put a pump in their mouth so that water is still flowing over their gills so that they can continue to breathe throughout this process. Because as we all know, sharks are fish and they can't breathe air. So if they are out of the water, they are not breathing. So we want to work up animals as quickly as possible. If we think it's going to take longer than a minute or so, then we uh, go through the necessary precautions to make sure that they're going to be able to get the oxygen that they need. And then we release the animal and it goes on about its life and it has contributed to science and we're very thankful for that. Um, and it's a really quick process. Uh, we're trying obviously not to harm or stress out the animal, but we do want to make sure that we can protect these animals so that we need so we need to get in as much information about them as possible. So that is a little bit about how we do a shark workup. Thank you all for attending. ago on August 8th, I was surfing out front or whatever you want to call what I was doing out there. It was a day like today, it was gray and blowy and bouncy in the water. And to the north of me, there was a bunch of diving birds, teeming sea life, something you always want to pay attention to out there. And I saw a large, what my denial brain told me, dolphin fin. It was very tall and it was uh, spiky and it went like this. I still told myself it was a dolphin fin. So I looked away and then I looked over again and there I saw a shark head out of the water. And then I thought, oh, that was not a dolphin fin. That was actually a shark tail because you know, dolphins go like this, sharks go like this. And my other initial thought was, of course I'm by myself when I see a great white shark head because no one's gonna ever believe this. So, you know, the shark looked at me and I looked at the shark and it was a big eye. It seemed like time stopped and we just kind of had this moment. And I thought, wow, this is really the coolest thing I've ever seen. And it's also time to paddle in really fast. And so that's what I did. And it, it was just amazing. It was a wonderful moment. And I stood in the beach and looked for the shark and didn't see it again. So I was kind of bummed about that. But it was an absolutely amazing experience. This year, I honestly just wanted to practice chalk drawing on the ground because of COVID, the festivals have been canceled, so I thought I'd do something in my backyard. And I thought that I would um, show the range of the shark. And so I, sharks return to the same spot every year. That's why this time of year, around August, especially August 8th, you know, I paddle out and I think, yep, same shark's probably here. I kind of say hello in my head. And uh, yeah, so I drew... Um, so I drew a great white and over a sort of stylized map going from Alaska 
down to Baja. And in red, I marked the general territory. The top of the map is, is a general outline of uh, Mauna Kea. And I've also put in um, vaguely where Hawaii is also in the map and the Shark Cafe, which is where sharks congregate. So cool. Well, I think, I don't know if you're interested, but I think we might need to do a dramatic reenactment of your shark sighting. Maybe a dry version on the beach. Should we give it a try? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Here we are out at the beach. Tell us about how far that shark was that day. Well, the shark was about 100 meters away. So we're trying to approximate that on the beach right where it happened. That large piece of driftwood at my six is about 100 meters from where we're standing. Imagine a flock of diving birds and teeming sea life around that piece of driftwood. From that arena comes a spy hopping great white. From this distance, at first your mind doesn't believe what it sees. But then you realize you just came eye to eye with the majesty of the great white shark. And this is the signal to terminate the surf session and paddle back to shore. I created a why worry corner. I, I found this sign that somebody had made on the beach. It says sharks swim at an average speed of one yard per second. That kind of got to me for three seconds. Then I thought I'm taking this home and I kind of created the shark shrine because the way I feel is, I mean, just be practical. Don't surf with open bleeding wounds and pay attention to the vibe. But other than that, you can't compete with the apex predator that can swim at one yard a second. So why worry? And as such, I have my surf wax and uh, surf comb in the shark's mouth. So whenever I use the wax or the comb, I have to pay homage so to speak and you know it's just a reminder to really pay respect and protect these really critical apex predators they're they're the kings out there oh the shark babe has such teeth Just a jackknife has old McKee's feet, and he keeps it out of sight. You know when that shark bites with his teeth, babe, scarlet billows start to spread. Fancy gloves, old. Where's old McKeith, babe? So there's never, never a trace of red. Now on the sidewalk, ooh, sunny morning, lies a body just losing light. He and someone sneaking round the corner. Could that someone be? Oh, Mac the Knight There's a tugboat Down by the river Don't you know where cement bags Are just drooping down Oh, the cement there Is for the way, yeah Five will get you ten Oh, Mac is back in town Now, did you hear how about old Louie Miller? He disappeared, babe, after drawing out all his cash. And now Mickey's, yeah, he spends like a sailor. Could it be our boys done something rash? Now Jenny Diver, old Suki Tawdry, old Miss Lottie Lania. And old Lucy Brown Oh, the line forms On the right, babe Now that Mackie's Back in town Look 
Look out. Oh, Mac is back. Well, we're ready for our last big segment um, for the end of our program, and we have a great lineup for you. We have first up Skylar Thomas of White Shark Video, who's really a fantastic photographer and filmmaker, and we're going to get a sneak preview of his most recent documentary on white sharks in South Africa and what's happening there. And then we'll have another quick visit from our own Justin Hull, Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary Visitor Center Manager. And then we'll get another song from our favorite ukulele friends, Ohana of Marin. And I just want to say they've also been with us for 15 years playing for Sharktoberfest. And then we'll get a glimpse of Christopher Chen's work. Um, he works, he's the executive director for CORE, which is the Center for Ocean Awareness, Research and Education. But he mainly works on policy and really advances ocean conservation for all of us. And this video is gonna give us a glimpse of how he got started on, in his career. And then lastly, we get to hear from our very own David McGuire, our, one of our co-hosts from Shark Stewards. He is the founder and director of Shark Stewards and has been working to protect sharks for 16 years. And he's going to share with us today uh, his new book. So it's called Sharks for Kids. And then he also is going to talk about sharks in the sanctuary and really relay the biodiversity of the sharks that are found here, as well as how you can get involved uh, in conservation efforts. So looking forward to spending the next little bit with you all. Hello everyone, Skylar Thomas here. Welcome to Sharktoberfest. Uh, today I am going to give you a sneak peek at the next feature length shark documentary I'm working on. You'll just see a two minute trailer and then we will do some interactive games. Uh, we'll be giving away some prizes today, giving away some of my shirts like this one and this one. Actually I have some photos of it from a previous Sharktoberfest with Andy Casagrande and me back when we used to be able to have events in person. All right, here is the trailer. This was filmed in South Africa in 2017, and I obviously got a little sidetracked with other projects, so I still have to wrap this project up. These people are being lied to. And the people lying are the educators. From 1964 up until now, we've never had a shark attack in a protected area. They haven't had a bite since where the nets were. Uh, where did you get that information? At the Sharks Board yesterday. Every trip we'd go to the Sharks Board hoping that there would be a dead shark, that they would dissect in front of us, and we would just think that that's the best thing. Did you find it educational? when you went to the Sharks Park. But All I remember is being scared when I came back to the beach and I didn't want to swim. Wow. There's a lot of money in fear. Not so much in the truth. Should we turn the cameras on? No, you do not swim on a beach that does not have shark nets. Because if you do, you will die. We're all indoctrinated from children. Killing sharks is big business, and the hotels are in on it. The bodies behind this door will break your heart. This is the third entanglement since I've been here. How long have you been here? Two weeks. This company is founded in the killing of marine animals while still claiming to be conservationists. 50 years of funding, and the big breakthrough is to put bait on hooks. This many years later, how can people still believe that that's the case? Because they want to believe it. Sharks? 
really teach us something about respect. So the nets going away is the end of a lot of people's livelihood, so to speak. If people had to witness the true cost of their vacation beaches, would it still be so easy to act like monsters? So what we're going to do for the game, um, we're going to see if you can identify shark species using my shirt design. It's the design I made for my short series called Shark Minutes. So on the front, you've got uh, shark teeth uh, in the positions of the 12 hours of the clock. And then you have the bodies of the sharks on the back. So we will just spin it and see where the clock lands. So the first person to answer the shark species correctly in the chat, um, the hosts of Sharktoberfest will send you coupons to go to my website and enter that coupon code and you can uh, choose which shirt design you want and which size and color. So. Um, even though the contest is using the Shark Minutes shirt that I'm wearing now, you also can choose the other design, uh, They Go, We Go. Alright, here goes the first spin. Okay, here we go. In case that was too hard, let's show the back side, the corresponding image, the uh, silhouette of the shark's body. I'm going to count 20 seconds. Ten. And okay, let's spin it again. We're looking at that tooth with the circle. And now let's show the corresponding body. Some of you have probably already answered, but I'm um, counting now. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, let's spin. Again, a pretty cool looking tooth, a little long and slender. Let's show the body of that shark. See if that helps you figure out which one it is. Notice how different each of these teeth are. Think about how the tooth design, as well as their body design, both give us clues as to where in the ocean these animals live and what they eat. Let's do one more and spinning. That tooth is a little bit harder to recognize, but I bet when I show the body, you will know it. So let's spin and show the body. And let's count. One, two, three. And done. Pretty magnificent animal, isn't it? Every single one of them is unique. Every single one of them has a special design and thus a special purpose, a special role to play in the ocean. And every single one of them is important and every single one of them needs to be protected. All right, the free codes will be given to the winners by the hosts of Sharktoberfest. And I am also giving a special 50% code, which I'll throw up on the screen right now. Anyone can use this code who was watching today and go in and order either of those shirts for 50% off. All right, I hope everyone enjoyed uh, using 
the walking quiz, the shirt quiz. You'll walk around with a quiz on your shirt if you get the Shark Minutes uh, shirt. And those of you who order, you will get a answer card so that you can be the expert. It's a little bit of a cheat card, but you get it. All right, hope everyone had fun. See you next year. Here we go. Hey, you know I know. Hey, you know I know. I'm a boo
Hi, I'm Christopher Chin, and I'm the Executive Director at CORE, the Center for Oceanic Awareness, Research, and Education. At CORE, we do many things, including marine protected areas, uh, advocacy, education, and policy work. And that's my forte. I focus a lot on the policy work. One of the coolest things in my job now, especially that I'm working on policy and global policy, is that I get to interact with many people at many levels of government in the United Nations. I was meant to be a child of the ocean. My dad was a diver before he met my mom. And this was, this was in the early days. This is when they were diving with equipment that we see in museums now that idea of being underwater always appealed to me. And I had these, these fantasies about, about sunken treasure and wreck diving and, and all of that. And it always called to me. And then when I finally got certified and began diving, I never looked back after that. I think I did a hundred dives my first year. I just fell in love with it and I couldn't get enough of blowing bubbles. I fell in love with underwater film and photography early in my dive career. I had this close-up opportunity with a bull shark. And as she swam by, she was not even three feet away from, there, from me. As she swam by, she looked me in the eyes and held the gaze for a good eight seconds. This is a sentient being trying to figure out who we are, why we're there, and do we pose any threat? And I got out of the water and I thought, I've been filming them and diving with them for years, and I had no idea. And if I don't have any idea, what about the rest of the people on the boat? What about people who've never been to the ocean? What do they think about these creatures? And at that point, I knew that sharks were imperiled. I didn't realize quite to what extent, but I realized they needed help. And that was my epiphany. I got out of the water and realized that it was my job to help inform people, to help change people's perspective of these animals and of the ocean. And that's where CORE began. I think that barriers to getting started are mostly in my head or mostly expectations. Growing up, I was taught I had to have a successful career. And that was, that was be a doctor, be an engineer. You, you had to have an education so that you could make money to support yourself. And I think that philosophy is changing and people are understanding more that they have to be happy with what they do. They have to have a passion that drives them. And if you are just doing something because you're told that it's what you're supposed to do, that doesn't fuel you. It doesn't ignite a fire. And when you do something that you love, then you are much more apt to do it well. And if what you love is the ocean or a particular creature and you want to work to support that, then by gosh, you need to you know, grab that with both hands and, and pursue it. You as an individual can make a difference and you can have an impact much more wide than you think. The choices that you make, the things that you buy, the people you talk to and the things that you do can influence others. For anyone at any age to help our oceans, we need to understand, we need to learn more. And if there's something that you don't understand or that you want to learn more about, then by all means, go find out, do some research, ask people, talk to people, uh, use the internet, explore, dig in and find the answers that you're looking for. Then once you have that information, you can use it to make better choices. You can use it to influence other people. It can be just your friends. It can be your family. And the more and more people that understand what's going on, the more and more people will be compelled to take action. And when more and more people are compelled to take action, that's when we start to change the government and our leaders. Remember, they don't, they are not supposed to tell us what to do. We are supposed to tell them what to do.
Happy Sharktoberfest. I'm David McGuire, and I'm here to welcome you to our annual Sharktoberfest celebration of the shark with our Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary and shark stewards, and all of our partners, nonprofits, and scientists, but especially you, to celebrate sharks and the sanctuary they live in. Shark Stewards was founded in 2006 to reverse the overfishing of sharks, to combat the shark fin trade, and to protect where they live in marine protected areas and sanctuaries like the Greater Farallons. We're part of the Earth Island Institute based in Berkeley, right across from my alma mater, Cal. We work in education, events like these in schools and universities, but we also apply science to conservation and changing policy through advocacy. I'm a diver, a research associate at the California Academy of Sciences. I'm a National Geographic explorer and an underwater photographer and filmmaker, as well as an ocean explorer. Today, I wanna to talk about California sharks, but also kind of all sharks off of our Pacific coastline and around the world. And a book that I wrote, Sharks for Kids, a junior scientist guide to great whites, hammerheads and other sharks in the sea. This is an 85 pound, 85 page book. It doesn't weigh as much as a young shark. Uh, it's 85 pages geared towards middle schoolers, but really suitable for adults and kids of all ages. And we'll go through some of it, but it has various exercises. It talks about uh, the shark family, taxonomy, how sharks related, the different orders of sharks, what makes a shark a shark, uh, shark behavior, shark biology, and the second part, we really go into the different taxonomy and special orders, including examples of around 30 different kinds of sharks from all around the world, which talks about their biology, uh, where they live, how many babies they have, and sometimes threats. And, and then it concludes with how we can better understand and better protect sharks. So there's the star of our show. Carcharod and Carcharias, which actually from the Latin means shark or rough tooth or serrated. They have these serrated teeth around three rows, 300 that continuously grow and they lose the outer ones and continue to grow them. So sharks don't have to go to the dentist and they feel with their mouth quite often and lose their teeth, which is their one of their toolkits. So it's a good adaptation to continue growing their teeth. White sharks are a large shark. They can get up to some say around 20 feet, 4,000 plus pounds, uh, incredible girth on the large females. As they get older, they get the scarring pattern, as you can see on the shark above the mouth. They have a large black eye that actually is, is very acute. Their vision is excellent. Large fins, especially the pectoral and the dorsal. Uh, large gills, large gills in front of that pectoral fin. They have this beautiful, gray or blue coloration and white underneath, which is called counter shading. And this gives them their name uh, sometimes when they roll over and you see this beautiful white, they call them the white sharks, but they really should be called maybe gray or blue sharks, or how about just magnificent sharks. These sharks do live off of our coastline. They migrate as adults as far west as Hawaii, and they come back and this annual migration to return to our greater Farallon's National Spring Sanctuary, feeding off the pinnipeds of seals and sea lions, uh, sometimes dead whales. And the females tend to go down to Southern California if they're pregnant or they give birth or off the coast of Baja. So we're learning a lot about these fish and their behaviors through remote sensing, through satellite tagging, and sometimes just through direct observation and photography like we do off of our boat, off of the Farallon Islands every Sharktober sometimes mistaken for a white shark in our waters and in the San Francisco Bay are the salmon sharks, which are closely related. They had that same torpedo or fusiform body shape, a large lunate pectoral uh, fin or, or caudal tail, and that is the tail fin. And then they had these more paddle shaped pectoral fins and a little bit rounder dorsal fin. But the thing that really distinguishes them is that Young white sharks or baby white sharks are around six feet when they're born, five to six feet. 
these guys get up to maybe six, seven, eight feet at their biggest. They're also darker. And sometimes they have this little pink margin from their favorite food, which is salmon. And they migrate north in the summer months all the way up to Alaska, chasing their favorite food, which is fish. We have some of the larger filter, filter feeding sharks. There are only three living now. Uh, the megamouth, which is a deeper shark. The whale shark, which is the largest fish in the sea and is a more tropical shark. And then the basking shark, which does migrate up of, off of our coastline. And you can see this one here with his mouth open, gulping larval fish, plankton, sometimes unfortunately pieces of plastic. And then those modified gill rakers that you can see catch that plankton like a sieve and then they swallow that. And then other fish like the the uh, thresher sharks, we have three species of Alopius off of our coastline. This is uh, the common thresher, Alopius fulpinus. We'll see it jumping out of, of the bay quite often. They have this extremely large uh, upper lobe on their caudal fin that they use as kind of a cracking motion and they'll turn, they'll swim at their prey, turn really quick, whip that tail and create a pressure wave or sometimes hit their prey and they come around and eat them. So a highly modified method of fishing. Uh, the star of the San Francisco Bay, it, or at least the largest shark that lives in the bay and we know gives birth in the bay, but also migrates as far north as British Columbia, as far south as Ma Baja. And we know this from direct tagging that we've done with the California Academy of Sciences, the seven gill shark, which is a more basal shark in the Hexancaniformidae related to the six gill shark, which also lives in the deeper waters of the bay, but typically more off the continental shelf and deeper water and rarely sees the light of day. Slower moving, they have these big paddle shaped fins, really large eyes with this reflective membrane, much like cats and dogs have to magnify that low light. And then also the six gills that distinguishes them from the other sharks, which have five. And then that more common smaller sharks, the hound sharks, like the leopard sharks, and the unfortunately named soup fin shark or school shark, which were named for their fins, which went into uh, the, the Chinese, Chinese laborers or fishermen that lived in the Bay or came to San Francisco as laborers and lived in areas like China camp. And, this is a dish of the emperors, but they would they favor this soup and a soup fin shark was one of the favorites. These sharks also live in the San Francisco Bay and our coastal margins, and they also give live birth, they pup in the San Francisco Bay. Their cousins also hound sharks are the brown and gray smooth hound, a smaller shark, three to four feet, uh, very gentle bottom living sharks. They eat invertebrates, crabs, dead fish, smaller fish like herring, and they keep the bottom clean. And then there's the swell shark. The swell shark is swell. It's called this because it will gulp water, inflate up. Sometimes it'll grab its tail and wedge itself into a rock or crevice to deter predation from other sharks or sea lions, which like to eat them. They're a smaller shark, three or four feet. Uh, they're a very camouflage, a beautiful, gentle shark. And they're unusual, they also lay egg cases. So many sharks give live birth, like the white sharks. Some sharks have a mixing of their reproductive uh, strategy called oval viviparity, like the white sharks, uh, where they have a, a egg hatched internally and then give live birth. Some sharks just give live birth like mammals and others lay eggs like the swell shark. And sometimes you'll see these little egg cases, they have an embryo in there, and they have this little strand that will hang up in kelp until that embryo gets a chance to uh, digest its egg and chew its way out to become a juvenile swell shark. Another egg layer is the, uh, the horn shark. This is the Pacific horn shark. These live all over the world. Uh, the, the Port Jackson shark looks very much like our Pacific horn shark. Uh, that lives in Sydney Harbor. These guys, sometimes you see them in the San Francisco, Francisco Bay, more, more often in the rocky subtitle habitat off of our coastline. Uh, their family and also their genus is heterodontous, meaning different teeth, because they have a plate and kind of a more pointed tooth to crush shells or crabs and then 
munch them down. These sharks also lay egg cases that are more spiral and the spiral will kind of auger into the sediments. And that, again, that embryo will live on an egg yolk until it's able to uh, get out of this keratin-like egg case and swim away. A deeper sea shark and also a large schooling shark, but surprisingly comes into the San Francisco Bay. And again, we believe to gestate, that is nurture their young internally uh, and give live birth is the dogfish. In this case, this is the Pacific spiny dogfish. And they're called this because they have these two spines right in front of their dorsal fins, which we believe are to deter predation. If a soft mouth animal like a sea lion or a seal bites on it, it might let them go. You might swim away to live another day. And there's an embryo that with that egg case uh, uh, that has been removed by dissection from a dead shark. And that shows the yolk and these sharks have two uteruses and they kind of have this little production line of hundreds of these embryos and eggs that kind of come out until they, the older ones, the more developed ones come out as a free swimming shark. And then the unlikely weird looking flat angel shark, which also lives in the sediments off of our coastline, uh, Squatina californica. So is she, we have our own genus of angel sharks. They live all over the world. Uh, the ones in the Mediterranean are almost extinct. They're extremely rare, including off our coastline. When I was growing up, we used to see these off the coastline of uh, LA and Santa Barbara, but there was a large commercial fishery, including one off Bodega Bay. It's now closed and this is a protected shark because they have not yet recovered. They live in the sediment, sometimes within them. They can ambush uh, a, a method called ambush predation where they spring off their tail and uh, they blend into, into their sediments or sometimes are buried in there until a fish comes by. But they also are nocturnal and forage at night and have an uh, omnivorous diet. And they have these little barbels on their nose as many sh sharks like nurse sharks do to kind of feel the sediments that might feel invertebrates or uh, animals like a crab swimming by. And then they have a large mouth that actually can suck that prey in. And then you have this sort of transitional form uh, that actually the angel sharks look a little bit more like a ray. They're flat and they have wing-like pectoral fins. This is a, a spiny, I mean, a, a shovel nose guitar fish. There are two species in the bay. They have this sort of shovel nose. They look kind of like a guitar, uh, but they're, they're also their pectoral fins are, are fused but they are not a shark. They are, are actually in the ray family and they live in, in the, the sediments also, the muds and the sands, and they forage nocturnally as well. This is the thornback guitar fish, which is in the guitar fish group, but they look a lot more like uh, what we think of as a stingray. And then of course the bat ray, which is the smiley, popular ray that swims along. Divers love to see them. They're beautiful. They literally fly in the water. They are a mobile array. They are related to eagle rays and manta rays, the giant ray that lives in the tropics. But they live on the bottom and they have these plate-like teeth that also grind shells and uh, happily swimming along. And they'll actually use those wings to stir up and even create holes in the bottom to uncover their prey. So when I've been diving, I see these big holes and you know that there are bat rays around foraging. And then we have other rays like the round stingray uh, that also has a little stinger, a little barb on its tail, as does the bat ray and other rays. That's a protective mechanism. Sometimes people step on these unwittingly and that, that spine will whip up with the tail and actually stab a person. And it's also a very pen, painful, venomous sting. The cure for that is to put hot water on it. We see these down in Southern California, particularly down an area that we call Ray Bay off of Seal Beach, where there are hundreds of these and there are also hundreds of people get stung each year. But it's also the uh, location of a nursery for many young white sharks who love to forage on these rays. And sometimes you'll see the stingers embedded in the sharks uh, mandibles around their jaws. So young white sharks, when they're born off of our coastline, typically in Southern California, 
forage on fish and they love to eat stingrays. And then the torpedo ray, which also lives off of the central California coastline and south, uh, is actually an electric ray. It creates this current between its two uh, pectoral fins and it will create a shock that can stun a fish or other prey and then they will consume them. If people get this shock, in some cases, not ours, it might be 20 volts, which is quite a, quite a jolt, but in some cases with the larger torpedo rays, it can be a couple hundred volts, which actually could give somebody a heart attack, could be fatal. So respect them and respect all these sharks and rays because they're amazing, as you can see how different they all are. And yet these are all in the larger Elasma Branker shark family. And then you have the big skate, which is the biggest skate, which is a kind of related to the rays, but they are not in the, the ray uh, order. And they, but they are also benthic. They live a very similar lifestyle. Uh, they flap their wings. Uh, in this case, the, the giant or the big skate can go down thousands of feet. They lay a, the largest egg case that we know, as big as a person's hand. Sometimes they have as many as four or five embryo inside that case, which is unusual. Usually it's one embryo per case. And again, these uh, embryo mates will nurture off of that yolk until they're ready to uh, chew their way out of that keratin purse and swim away. So these are really interesting kinds of flat sharks, we call them. And then of course, the star of Sharktoberfest and of our coastline during what we call Sharktober, the summer months, bounded around uh, late August and then all the way into the fall, uh, early fall, November, late fall, that is November. And we call these events Sharktober because this is when these big sharks, sometimes the pregnant white shark females like this, come back from their migration to either forage or to give birth. And that's when we see a lot more off our coastline and coincidentally, uh, non-coincidentally that is, they, you see more interactions, more bumps, more investigations when, uh, when people are out either swimming or paddle boarding or flying drones. Why do we call it Sharktober? Well, thanks to some of the work done by the Monterey Aquarium, and Stanford's uh, top lab uh, with Barbara Block and her graduate students, we see these sharks migrate west. If you look in the middle by May, June, they're in this area that's been termed the White Shark Cafe, where through recent research, we're seeing they're doing this incredible diving program uh, uh, profiles over a thousand feet deep. Uh, in some cases, we think, it, or scientists think it's been displaying like maybe for a female, but these sharks are so spread apart, even out there, it may be they're hunting on giant squid. It's possible they're all also breeding out there. The gestation of a white shark is around a year, possibly a little bit longer. So that's why the females will separate out from the males uh, if they come back pregnant. So if you look at this slide over here, January, uh, they're already on their migration. They're all the way out in the Pacific by May, June, they're completely gone. And by late summer and uh, September, they start to return to the, our coastline and these rookeries or breeding areas like the Farallons, like Point Reyes, like uh, uh, Año Nuevo, but also farther south like Guadalupe Island and in the Sea of Cortez. And then they start to do that migration west again in the colder, winter months, November, really December, January. So if you look at this next profile, that's probably about early winter. So these yellow are sea surface temperature uh, data points when the shark gets near the surface. This is from a satellite tag that's been placed on its back. There's also an acoustic tag here at the Farallons. And the red ones are where the tags fall off. And if you're lucky, they fall off near shore so you can get them and get the rest of the data. If you're not lucky, you have to get out in a boat or hopefully somebody can find that as far west as Hawaii. But what we're seeing is this incredible migration of these large sharks, the adults, each year, which takes an incredible amount of energy, if you can imagine, swimming 100 miles a day for weeks or months at a time. 
we're also learning some really interesting behavior and facts about the young sharks that live off our coastline. And most of this work has been done by Chris Lowe down at Cal State Long Beach. And this study was just published that shows this movement of young sharks north of Point Conception. Historically, we rarely saw young sharks, uh, young white sharks off of Central California and Northern California. But in 2015, there was this marine heat wave, they called it the blob in the North Central Pacific. Uh, it maintained these higher sea surface temperatures. And what that did is it gave an avenue for these young sharks, which prefer a temperature range between maybe 55 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere peaking around 78, 76, 70 preferentially. It gave them the ability to move up because they have less mass, less volume, and they get colder. Typically they would stay down in the Southern California Bight where they're born. We see them off of all of these coastlines, Santa Monica Bay, San Diego, off the sandy beaches of LA, foraging on fish. But uh, in 2015, 2016, we started to see these young sharks and uh, sub-adults off of Capitola, where there was an aggregation of, but also there's now one off of Monterey, uh, also Santa Barbara seeing larger sharks than historically what we've seen in these aggregations of young sharks. So this is a result of climate change, we believe, of and these anomalous sea temperatures, which are having a distribution of this cohort or this age group of sharks distributing along their coastline, as well as we're seeing the population recover because they are protected. I think it's cool. Most surfers are fascinated by it. And we have not seen an uptick in white shark uh, bites on humans, fortunately. Why are sharks cool? Why do we celebrate sharks? Well, in this tropical example, we see the hammerhead like the white shark, like the mako shark at the top of the food chain. They are the regulator. They maintain the health and the balance of the population below them. They eat the sick, the stupid, and the slow, and they leave behind the quick, the smart, and the healthy. Sharks are also really important for maintaining this intact trophic level. So if you remove the roof of the house, the walls fall in. Uh, you relieve that regulatory pressure off the secondary or tertiary predators. They in turn eat the next level, which also allows in a proliferation of the species underneath, which in the case of a coral reef might be, uh, there are no more uh, species that eat the algivores, the ones that eat algae off coral, or sometimes a lot of proliferation of lionfish. Uh, so there's not a balance in this system and it creates uh, an unhealthier system that has less diversity and has less abundance. And that, that, that analogy also works off of our coastline in the case of the mesopredators, predators, which are marine mammals. Uh, in the case of California sea lions, they have almost expanded beyond the carrying capacity and they're getting diseased, they're starving. So we need more sharks to take care of our little furry marine mammal friends in a biological sense. Uh, sharks, are threatened with extinction globally. Around one third of open ocean sharks are threatened with extinction. The numbers are staggering, between 70 and 100 million sharks killed for their fins alone, for the shark fin trade. Uh, but we're also over harvesting sharks through bycatch accidentally or, or uh, not intentionally for swordfish or tuna, but we kill tens of millions of blue sharks, mako sharks. They're disappearing from the seas. And because we don't care so much about sharks as we care about sea turtles, or we care about marine mammals like seals or on the land, polar bears, or even panda bears. Uh, we love them less and we don't want to protect them as much, but they're every bit as important. In some cases, even more important. Other threats such as climate change, habitat loss are also creating an impact. One study shows that almost 77% of the shark biomass, shark and ray populations overall have been reduced since we began industrial fishing. We're fishing them too hard. And in many cases, we're not even eating them or discarding them for the, the body for their fins, or we use them for fish food or just discard them as bycatch. It's why we need large protected areas like our marine national monuments like our national marine sanctuary. So people are not commercial fishing that we, these animals have an area of sanctuary. 
an area that's protected. And the goals globally are to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. We have a long way to go. We're at about seven and a half percent protected globally under these networks of internationally protected areas or in national waters. In one case, the Antarctic, uh, the Papahanaumokuakea, which are the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, Marine National Monument, our largest, um, but it's not enough. And these animals need more room, especially long ranging, uh, far swimming animals like white sharks. They swim east to west. There are no protected areas on the open seas. There are no migratory, no take zones. And these animals that we love, that we protect, are trying to protect here in California are getting killed on long lines as bycatch, caught in gill nets, even off of California until we can phase out the gill net fishery, we're losing these sharks. And it's 90%, 98% of the habitable space on earth is our ocean. We should really call it planet ocean. So we can do a lot more to protect our ocean that takes care of us through all of these ecosystem services, through climate, through oxygen, through food, through recreation, through transport. We need our oceans. So we need to work harder to protect more of them from overfishing and these other impacts that are affecting not just sharks, but marine mammals, sea turtles, and even plankton. So we're working on increased protection in the San Francisco Bay and near shore waters. Uh, we have a project that it's a community science that you can participate in. Uh, we're gleaning data through social media, through direct observations called Shark Watch California. And we have come up with a QR code. There's an app where we're trying to look at the impact on recreational fishermen that are killing pregnant seven gill sharks in the San Francisco Bay where they come to give birth. This sharks had maybe 80 newborns ready to be born or 80, 80 uh, babies ready to be born uh, for sport primarily, not even for food or young white sharks that have been caught more than once damaging their gills and tiring them out. These are protected species, but they're being fished for sport. We're also trying to get a grip on sometimes range, uh, a shift in species range through climate change. So we're looking at for data and participation through this citizen science program. And you can go to sharksewards.org and learn more about the Shark Watch program. But also we're working in our California marine protected areas. Uh, I co-chair what's called the Golden Gate MPA Collaborative Network. We work with the state of uh, California Fisheries uh, Department, the Fish and Wildlife Department, the Ocean Protection Council, and the California Academy of Sciences, collecting data underwater, sometimes subtitly, to better understand our MPAs, but also to communicate how this network of state waters inside that three mile zone or around the islands uh, are benefiting marine life. So in some areas like the North Farallons and around Southeast Farallons where I showed these pictures, these are no take zones. You cannot fish in these areas at all, commercially or recreationally. The white, the blue areas is a, is a conservation area. Uh, it's a state marine conservation area that you can pull fish for some species. So this network of MPAs, marine protected areas goes from the Oregon border to the Mexican border. There are 124, including special closures for birds and marine mammals. And ultimately, we hope to bring some of these to protect habitat like eelgrass, uh, nursery areas for leopard sharks and bat rays, and nursery areas for seven gill sharks to create no fishing zones and habitat protection in the San Francisco Bay. Each Sharktober, I lead trips out, uh, university classes, but also public trips to our National Marine Sanctuary, to the Farallon Islands. We educate, we look at wildlife, we count whales, we make observations. Sometimes we see great white sharks and add to the database through photo ID to determine what individuals have returned, perhaps new ones, look at behavior among marine mammals, look at for rare species, and really have an incredible experience, a day-long trip out to the Farallons. And you can join us on one of them this Sharktober go to our website and find out how you can join us. And you can join us by volunteering. Uh, we're a big network. The, the Sanctuary Association needs your help. Uh, we're nonprofits too. We need your donations. We need your time. Most of all, we need your love to protect sharks and the sanctuary that we love. So thanks for joining us for Sharktoberfest and 
and, and please support all your partners, at, uh, all of our nonprofit partners, all of the participants at Sharktoberfest, all of the people who are working uh, to learn more and to share uh, the knowledge around our coastline and marine animals and how to maintain and protect them in perpetuity. You can order Sharks for Kids online uh, at sharkstewards.org and that will help support shark stewards as well. And I'll sign it and give you a sticker. Thanks to our sponsors, especially the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary for supporting Sharktoberfest year after year. NOAA, of course, uh, our, our funders, the California Academy of Sciences and our grant, granting agencies, but also the Earth Island Institute, which is our foundation where Shark Stewards lives across from the Berkeley campus. Thanks for watching. Please join us next Sharktoberfest, uh, but also help us celebrate and protect sharks year round, day after day, celebrating sharks, celebrating where they live and protecting our San Francisco Bay, our Pacific Ocean and our world ocean. So thank you again for listening. I'm David McGuire with Sharktoberfest signing off. Enjoy the rest of the program. Wow, David, that was such a fantastic program. Thank you so much. Uh, you just give me so much hope and as do all of our partners working so hard uh, to promote conservation for sharks. It really is a bright spot during this uh, kind of tough time that we've all been through during the pandemic. So thank you for that. And thank you all for joining us today. That was such a rich uh, program of learning, um, and experiencing some really fun little tidbits throughout the day. Thank you, Carol and Sarah and Justin and all of the volunteers and the staff and supporters of our Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. This has been a great Sharktoberfest and hopefully next year we'll be together healthy and in person to celebrate our sharks and our sanctuary. The oceans connect us all and now more than ever, we humans need a healthy ocean and a healthy ocean needs our love and support from the plankton to the sharks. So please stay healthy, support our Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary and all of our sanctuaries and marine protected areas. Let's celebrate marine life year round and hopefully we'll see each other next year for Sharktoberfest in person. Stay well.